whether or not you're searching fastest G80 or crazy G80, I want you to see me. There's gonna be people out there, they're gonna say E36 is great. You can make a thousand horsepower with piston rods, cut ring, ARP head studs. I've been there, I've done that. That motor is not a 1200 horsepower motor. Trust your tuner, because your tuner is the guy that's seen the most. Your shop is probably wrong. If a tuner is good and your tuner says, yo, you need to do a boost test, you probably have a boost leak, make sure your shop boost tests it. What's the best BMW motor that they've came out with in a long time? S55. B58 is not even in the category, in my opinion. <laughs> and like, and like oh, what's yeah. the best? I was not expecting you to yeah, say that. Yeah, no one, no one is. <laughs> Everyone's like, B58, S55 is the best. They've just been given an amazing opportunity. Welcome back to another episode of the Street Alpha Podcast. I'm your host, Tukes, and today we are at RK Tunes in West Babylon with Jordan. Let's clap it up for Jordan. I clap for myself? Yeah, you can clap for yourself. Everyone always makes a comment about the clapping every single episode. Sorry. I tried not to this time, but you brought it up yourself. <laughs> so yeah, nobody's in here except for us. Yeah. So um, appreciate you for taking the time to do this interview. Um, I know we've been in contact for a couple mm -hmm. of years over various different situations mm -hmm. with my Supra or just picking up parts or whatever it is. Um, and now I, I have the pleasure of sitting with you and talking about cars, which yep. is pretty cool actually. Yes. So um, you just came back from Japan. I see you're doing some drifting stuff now, which I would have never even imagined. You seem mm -hmm. more of like a, you know, technical tuner kind of guy messing in the, you know, messing around in shops, taking motors out and so on. But the drifting thing is pretty cool. And uh, I think last week when I had came, I think it was two weeks ago, yep. I came here. And uh, one of your employees is like, oh, he's, he's in Japan. Yep. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> You're like, hey, I want to set something up. They're like, hey, he's not here. He's not even I'm here. Like, I'm like, bad week to not be here. <laughs> yeah. I know. We spoke before yeah, yeah. that. So I was like, all right, well, all right, cool. So we're here. We're finally here. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of topics that I want to talk to you about. Hopefully today we can get some answers that I've been trying to get answered on the podcast, not due to uh, people, just just me asking the right questions. So can you talk about your Japan trip? Because I kind of I kind of want to know about the yes. drifting stuff. I'm getting we more can start into that. there. Yeah. Japan, top place in the world I've ever been to. OK. S aside of drifting, this is the coolest thing in the world. Going somewhere you can't talk, you can't read any sign. You right. have no idea what's going on. Best thing ever. But the drifting part, which is the car stuff while you're here. Yeah. Um, six months ago or so. I went, I got invited with friends to go to Japan. They all go there many times to Ebisu or Ibisu. Um, <laughs> Ebisu. I, pronounce it. I always hear Ebisu. I hear Ebisu yeah. also. And uh, they go there, they drift. They all have JZX 100s or JZX 90, which is like a rear wheel drive Toyota right. one Toyota. JZ thing. Yeah. And they all go drifting there. So I went, I was supposed to borrow a car and drive for like free. Okay. And then the car I was supposed to borrow didn't work out in time. Yeah. So I was there and my wife was like, buy a car. Just buy a car, like just buy a, whatever car you're gonna buy. Just buy a car. Wow, real bad influence. <laughs> and I bought a, a JZX 100. Yeah. And six months ago, I drifted. I drove two and a half days, and then I came home and I felt like, damn, I really flew to Japan. I only drove for like two days. Yeah. It's not like, and you're getting used to right hand drive drifting. Oh, that's true too. Crazy right hand drive over there. And wow. Yeah, it's when you're like drifting and then you're like downshift 80, 70, 80 miles per hour from third to second gear like sideways. It's like it gets real. It gets real, real fast. But um, I did that. And then there was another opportunity. A lot of people go like two times a year to yeah. go drifting there. So the next one was a bit like open. The new, um, the next Matsuri they call it, Drift Event. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are going, like all YouTubers are going, uh, Drift HQ people are going. And they said, are you coming? Are you coming? So I said, yeah, sure. Let's go. So I yeah. decided I went. I drove for five days or so in Japan, drifting in Japan. So that was my whole purpose. And it's, it's great. So your car is just basically chilling there. Yeah. The car lives there. It does. The car I bought has a title, but okay. I don't think I'll ever import it here because it's worth more just selling it to some other uh, dumb American like me that bought an overpriced GZX 100 <laughs> in Japan. Yeah. And then they can keep it there or whatever. Right. Most people import, import nice, clean cars. Is it a common thing? Because I remember there was this podcast I watched that TJ Hunt had, mm -hmm. and he was talking about a lot of different cars that he has and that he keeps them over there. Is that the same kind of like area that he keeps his cars at? Do you know? I have no, I doubt it. Okay. He probably bought cars that are not the 25 year rule to import yet. Right. So like he just has them in storage facilities, wherever, and then he'll import them when they become legal. Mm -hmm. This is not that. I okay. don't know if this car's able to be imported yet. 
It's a 90 something. So right. like at worst next year would be or something. But then is it like, even if it is like legal, mm-hmm. you still have to get the crash testing situation. Nah, no, 25 years or older. I think in the U S yeah. you can import anything without any safety standards or oh, without like any that. safety, nothing. Okay. It just comes in. Okay. I didn't even know that. I yeah. thought it was just like a, like you have to pass, even if it's no. 25 years. No, if it's 25 years, you do nothing. I, I mind you, it's, I don't know if it's 25 years of production date or yeah. the date the car was sold or whatever, but like right. there's a 25 year rule, they call it. And then the car can be imported and there's no, um, no anything. Wow. So how long did it take for you to get used to the right hand drive situation? It's like one drive, day. It's drifting. Yeah. That's what, crazy. I would say like one day I wasn't great. Like now I'm better, but right. like one day I was able to do the thing, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, use the e-brake that doesn't really work great in the car. Um, I would say half a day, one day, first day I was able to like full blown drift in it, Oh wow! but there's still some levels of awkwardness in it. Yeah. Um, but nothing really, really horrible. Like day two, day three, I was okay at driving it. Then I went, um, I drove other right hand drive cars since then. Yeah. And it's not that weird. Really? It's not that weird. So do you ever have a situation where you like miss shift or anything like that or go into the wrong gear? Um, cause that seems one, like it'd two, be the most common thing. Like one, two, three, four, you're not like you're accelerating, but you're not really, really drag racing right. and drifting. Like when you're by yourself or with friends, mm-hmm. so you're shifting quick, but the only thing sketchy is three to two downshift, like wall mm. sideways. Like there's one track there. You come against the wall. Yeah. You come back the other way and you do a three to two down, like in drift while floating a three, three to two downshift. And then you, that if you miss, you could stop drifting and the guy could hit you if he's close or spin okay. out. But like, there's no wall there. That's the only thing weird for me. Right. Some people have more trouble. Some people have trouble placement in the car. Yeah. Cause they're on the other side. So everything feels strange. Right. 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 My right. friend of mine's pro drifter. And he's like, it takes me a bunch of laps to get comfy. And he's like best. He won the guy. Chelsea Nova won FD. And really? He said it takes him a bunch of laps to get used to it. But here's the thing. He feels a lot more than me. I'm not that good. Yeah. So like for me, I'm just barely getting by. For him, there's like a lot of thought going into it. Yeah. And yeah. he has the car exactly where he wants. So for me, I guess maybe because I haven't been doing it for 10 years, I'm just like sliding around having fun. So for me, it's just like another thing. And he's he's there with you? He Definitely. went to this one. Oh, wow, that's dope, dude. But and he's he, like real good. He has the, uh, what does he drift? The He did, He drove a Mustang for RTR. Mustang, the Mustang. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, I was just watching him. Um maybe like a month ago when mm-hmm. I was unwrapping my car and he was uh, at, I think it was the, it was the finals. Yeah. Was like he, the, won. he won. Like he won right. FD. Yeah. He won FD. But I forgot. I forgot where it was. What was the last, what was the uh, final that the, uh, I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah, really we, watch the live that much. I watched that day, the live. Because yeah. I wa- yeah. I watched it too. It was pretty cool. He was up against the, uh, the Supra. I think maybe. it was the, maybe somewhere over there. It was pretty cool though. Pretty cool mm-hmm. to watch. Yeah, he's good. So like he said, it takes a bunch of laps because of car placement and feel of like what the car does. Yeah. We throw it this way, one side lifts and whatever. And me, I'm just like, if you have a sim driver that feels nothing, they yeah. can hop in a car and drive whatever. I'm not that good. But yeah. like the same thing, I don't think about everything going on. Mm. But the right-hand drive is not bad. Some people have trouble though. I mean, I haven't even like even got a little bit of, of an idea of how you even start like mm. in the actual car. I can see sim because a lot of people say that sim is actually good for like getting the mechanics down, mm-hmm. but um, I still don't understand the concept yet. Really? I think you just have to one of those things you have to feel it you out. Have to right? do it. I yeah. think a lot of it. I can't do a sim. Oh, you can't. If you do start a sim. on a sim and then you move to driving. It's great. I started in drifting like okay. in real cars. Yeah, and I I bought a sim and I bought cheap shit like used steering wheel whatever. Right. I sold it all. I bought a little bit better. I didn't ball out, ball out, but like it adds up. So I bought all that stuff and I suck. I can't do two turns. <laughs> Really? It's so hard. There's some disconnect, but they say if you get used to driving without the feeling of the tire and the grip and everything, yeah, yeah. and you hop in a car, you're like amazing. I feel like maybe you have to have like a very a very good setup to kind of have that like that true driving I feel. No, I don't know. That's, that's what I. That's I bought I a direct drive steering wheel. It's just not a two thousand dollar one. It's like eight hundred dollar one, and the uh, pedal is like six hundred dollars. So they're definitely not like the original setup I had was like dirt cheap. Yeah, this is like good. I don't know, good but cheap. <laughs> That's the thing. Interesting. Yeah, I think I'm gonna start with the sim. I'll probably get. That's probably gonna be my way into uh, into drifting before I even think about buying a car. Go for. Um, have you gone for a ride with someone? No, I know. I, I haven't. I haven't yet. I'm Do waiting that. for the next event. I'm gonna go with Calvin. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. He's so good. he's yeah. I mean, he's been telling me to go, but I've just been so busy with other stuff. So we'll get there though. We'll get there. 
Um, but that's cool, man. I, I, I hope that, you know, you keep enjoying these events that you go mm -hmm. to with the drifting stuff. And, um, hopefully I can make it to Japan one day and do a uh, ride along. Too. It's crazy. It's sick. So, um, let's talk about some tuning stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're primarily known for tuning at, you know, obviously yep. your shop. So can you talk about how you got started in, into uh, tuning? Yes. So when I was 18 years old, okay, I worked in a, from, from 13 to eight and to 21, I worked at a I think clamp. we're the same age, right? How old are you? I'm 32. I'm 32. Oh, yeah. graduated you feel young or you feel old? Um, I feel younger the more people I meet. Okay. Because, you know, it's just yes. like, there's a lot of people who are, are older and they just seem much older, but then it's like, it's like, they don't even know I'm 32. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not that You're old. Yeah. yeah, same thing, 09. Right. So um, I worked 13 to 21, same people, clam bar, Mexican restaurant, and I saved up money while working there and going to high school mm -hmm. to turbo an E36 that I had. Oh, wow. That was my first car. Yeah. And then uh, let's say $1,500 for the full eBay turbo kit special. And I needed, I was like, damn, a tune is the same $1,500. How the hell? Like, that's crazy for me at the time. <laughs> I was like 17 years old like right. in high school doing this, putting together my pennies. And I was like, this is crazy. I can't do this. So then I went online. There was guys doing like DIY tuning, like use this tune and use this tune. And I, I messaged a bunch of them. They were like, buy these injectors, buy this math. I'll give you a tune. It's going to run. It's going to drive normal. You can tweak it, but we'll help you. There's a few DIY guys. And from that, I, that's how I sort of got started because I didn't okay. want to pay what yeah. I charge now. And then I end up doing more very quickly than these big tuning companies. So like mm. these big tuning companies were like, let's say there was three brands um, offering blow through mass airflow sensors. So like you put a sensor in a charge pipe mm -hmm. instead of in front of a turbo. Right. And like mine, your Subaru has came in front of the turbo forever. So it runs and drives like that, but it drives better the closer to the engine. So I made that work. And then by that point I was actually like eight, I was probably 19 in college. Okay. And I had a Dakar yellow E36 M3. Mm. And I made that work. And there was two legit companies offering the same thing. So I started saying, why is no one offering this? Why is no one doing this? Of the five people tuning them, only two are offering this. Right. So it doesn't make sense. So I started offering online for free. Yeah. Hey, does anyone want a tune for Turbo E36? I figured out X, Y, and Z. This works. And then I got uh, banned off the forum back to when Beamer Forms. They banned me and they said, you are offering something for free that vendors pay to yeah, sell. Yeah, I was going to say that. Vendors. So they were like, become a vendor or you cannot post anymore. So I was 18 years old paying, I think it was like $100 a month or something or $200 a month, whatever it was. It was yeah. too much money. And I was like, the, there was another big tuner at the time. And I wasn't a tuner. I was just a kid. Right, starting up. And I, another tuner at the time was super disrespectful. And was like, I'm not worried about you. You're just going to blow up a bunch of cars or just talking shit. Yeah. So I was like, I'll just pay the $200 a month and give it away. You know? Yeah. So I did that. I tuned a few people's cars and it didn't just like work a little bit. It worked better than what people were offering. Like Damn. people were saying like, you can't use bigger than 60 pound injectors or 630 CCs for like CC guys. Um, okay. I had 1,000 cc working. They were saying the ignition system sucks. It misfires past 400 horsepower. It was just um, the poor tuning of okay. these legit tuners that were causing a lot of these problems. And I was a guy that had no tuning background, no yeah. engineering background, just a kid at the time. But I just did homework, looked things up online as good as possible, and did something with it. Like right. now there's like Horsepower Academy, I think, in Australia. Yes. yes. That – I've never – I know it's so bad. I've never looked at their courses or whatever. I've they're, never they're signed up really for it. They're really good. They're really but good. Yeah. That's what I, every video I've seen, it's like, they seem like they're on the ball yeah, they're for how detailed. technical they are, what they know. But back in, so you say you graduated 2009, 2009, yeah. 2010, that was not that a thing. That was not a thing. You couldn't, you'd go on some forum, read some posts from some random guy yeah. about how they thought something worked. So that's how I learned. I started tuning cars like that. Yeah. And then because this guy, if that guy didn't push me, I wouldn't be here today. Mm. You know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if he didn't call you, if he wasn't like a douchebag or anything. Yeah, if he yeah. wasn't just a douchebag. And now yeah. like looking back, like I've been doing better over time and. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, can you talk about the, the that platform yeah. in the E36 a little bit and what you've kind of discovered at, at that time? Yeah. So back then I did them, they were making, and mind you, like I didn't, there were shops that gave me opportunities to tune cars and they right. also needed someone to tune cars because they were, so it was like help. It was a mutually beneficial thing. Right. And I got paid like very minimal money and they were probably still charging customers. Yeah. So <laughs> I wasn't mad though. 
I started doing turbo 36s and I had my car, it ran and drove fine and good. And then I learned more and more over time mm-hmm. and I invested some level of money in like systems that could um, read knock or detonation okay. where like new cars, you'll data log and see it pull timing. Right. When you have a ECU from the nineties, they don't always do that. So yeah. you gotta like plug in a scanner and do all that. So I learned from that and then I started doing it for shops, doing more and more. And then it was like, everyone said, you can't make 400 horsepower. We would make 500 pump gas. And I was working with a shop that like, I guess looking back, they were really a pioneer in trying things. They mm. weren't the smartest in the world, but they would buy five turbos and try each one. So okay. for me, working with them really allowed me to progress and take off for the fact that I got to do things that online people said didn't work. More power, bigger injectors. And then I worked for that shop, ended up making something like the 1100 horsepower range, like wheel horsepower. Probably like, it's probably been like 10 years or nine years or eight years ago. Yeah. So like in terms of like length of doing this, it's been a while in terms of like experience. Um, I've seen all ends of the E36 spectrum in terms of turboing okay. from 300 horsepower to let's say 1200 horsepower. And I think there's a sweet spot like every other car. Mm-hmm. You make too much power. The motor's only good to a certain point. So can you talk about the the actual like yeah. the block itself, the, the head? Yeah, yeah, sure. So it's a E36 motor. It's like iron block, good flowing aluminum head. The the limit, closed deck or open deck? Uh, it's all it's closed deck. Okay. So it's great seven eight hundred horsepower motor. There's gonna be people out there. They're gonna say E36 is great. You can make a thousand horsepower mm-hmm. with piston rods, cut ring, ARP head studs. I've been there. I've done that. I mean, the same guy with Chelsea Nova. We ran, um, let's say eight nine hundred wheel with a bunch of nitrous to spool the turbo and Vanos, and we cracked multiple of the blocks. We broke multiple head gaskets. Like. I've been through bad things yeah. when pushing it, but I've also learned in that what works really good. That motor is not a 1200 horsepower motor. Okay. It's a seven, eight, 900 wheel, amazing power per pound of boost, spools great, but um, the block, like the limits, right. block cracks around the head stud holes sometimes randomly. So like you don't really, really know. It's just an age thing, I think a lot of it. Yeah. Um, the block is also weak, so it's like a hit or miss depending on the casting you get. You're dealing with really old castings right. from BMW, okay. so the block can crack. And then also, um, with the ARP 2000 and the cut ring gasket, it's a 50-50 shot if you crack the block or blow the gasket with the cylinder, pure cylinder pressure yeah. from power. Like newer engines, like the B58, these guys are running $2,000 head gaskets right. that lock into the block to stop it from pushing out. Mm. If you do that on an E36 motor, in my personal opinion, okay, you're going to fix the gasket, but the block's still going to crack at like somewhere between 800 and 900, 950 foot pounds of torque. Wow. And people can say, oh, this guy made this much. And this guy, when I say power, I'm talking about with standard ish cams, normal um, cam timing and movement, and a really fat power curve. You can make 1200 horsepower and make the same torque as someone that's making a thousand horsepower and your power curve shit because you put really big cams, you're trying to rev really high. So right. my numbers are all like uh, based on certain things, right? Certain but steps. it's a great motor for seven, 800 wheel, seven, 800 wheel with like okay. pistons and rods, even stock. They make 600, 650. And it's a lightish car, rear wheel drive, stick shift. So a lot of the limitations with the older style BMWs, um, N54, N55, those are open deck, correct? Um, yeah, N54 is N55. open deck. N55 is open deck. And those N- are like aluminum, aluminum right. motors. And the issues really with those are like E36 is great because it's so easy to make power. Yeah. Like pound for pound. Whatever fuel you're on, you're maxing out your turbo on mm-hmm. pump ED5, and like it's great. Right. N54, higher compression, a little bit shittier of a cylinder head, so yeah. it takes more boost to make the power, which is fine. But really, it's like the electronics of that. Right. Like E36, I can put a chip in it, like a yeah. third tune. Right. My injectors, my math, no mechanical issues, no boost leaks, no fuel pressure drop. Close my eyes, and they'll make 800 wheel if the setup can do it. Right. I did one the other day, made 650 wheel horsepower stock engine on an M3. That seems, that, see, I, if, if I were to do like an E36, mm-hmm. I, I would do, I'd be in that range. Yeah. Maybe like 550, yeah. 650. That it's a great like spot. It's, yeah. Like I have one that makes, I would say 450, 500. Mm-hmm. Another one, I never done it. It could do six. Yeah. Um, 
another one 450 like all in that range it's a very nice spot you're not breaking transmissions you're right. not breaking axles it's a 20 plus year old car that's what i'm saying but they sound great when they're probably almost 30 year call it 30 yeah. year old <laughs> it's getting there bro it's getting there all right see now you're starting to make you feel a little old yeah <laughs> so um so is there any other limitations to that that platform as a whole if you're if you're trying to build the e36 um if there, no i i mean i personally have driven eight nine hundred wheel e36s like yeah. a lot um i don't know compared to other people what people think is a decent amount but if you take like my three thirty sixes, i've driven the most each one in a year i put twelve thousand miles on them yeah and i drove them at 700 to 850 wheel like all the time right tons of abuse and no real major issues no real major problems but limitation wise transmission diff potentially act different axles depending on how you drive yeah. trans is going to break so the problem is like an f80 m3 if it's rated for 500 horsepower and then you make a thousand you're doubling it if an e36 is made for 250 and you make 500 you're doubling it right so everything's not designed for 800 so your F80 might not have axle problems or drive shaft problems on the street right. at, let's say, 700. It's pretty good. An E36 is 700. Over time, you're going to wear down the transmission. Right. Really. That's really the main weak point. So it just, in my opinion, it's not worth it to spend $20,000 from the transmission back on E36 when a newer platform is going to shit on you anyway. Mm, that makes sense. So it's I more know, for I'm fun. A, I'm an E36 guy. Yeah. And like I've had probably 10 Turbo E36s. Over the course of time. I have three currently. And like I'm not going to say I don't like them. I don't love them. They're great. But yeah, it's, it should be a fun thing yeah. to build one that's like really fast. Yes, you can put a TH400. You can put a C4 transmission in it. Mm -hmm. You can put some crazy rear-wheel drive thing or some potential, like, like we said, our mutual friend Frank. He has an all-wheel drive one. Yeah. You could do that. But when a stock G80... <laughs> he's gonna like put out crazy times unless you're frank stuff. man unless you're frank and you yeah. can yeah frank but no no only his car his car now has a power curve same thing his car moved the power curve over makes less torque his car power curve wise is an anomaly to what they break at in my opinion okay due to his fancy cylinder head fancy intake like it's weird stuff that is not yeah. common that's not common i'm right. talking about like the 99 percent right the general oh. general people who are just going to get a car and make it, you know, make it fast, put a turbo on it, yes. you know, and do minimum work, basically. Yeah. Uh, Frank is in a league of his own when yes. it comes to this because He's he has... He's uh, himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, we're going to definitely, hopefully have him on soon. So we'll be able to talk about his setup. I'm not sure if you know too much about it, but I'd rather let him kind of oh, explain. Fine, fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. So you have, you said you've had three uh, E36s. I have had probably 10 turbo E36s. E36s. 10? Probably. I have three... E36 M3 turbos currently. Wow. And your fastest one is what? They're all stock engine, head gasket, head studs, basic. My fastest one I had made about 950 wheel horsepower. It was a 68, 70, 35 pounds of boost. I drove it at like 880 usually. Oh, and that's not a lot compared to like modern cars, but that's related to like the cylinder heads flow a lot less. You right. need more boost to get more air into the engine. Right. But like the E36s are efficient heads. So they make good power per pound of boost. Can you talk about Vanos? Um, in terms of people rebuilding Vanos because it's noisy, it almost never has an effect on how it performs. If my shit is like a tiny bit noisy, I'm not rebuilding it. Like an E36 Vanos, for example. Okay. If it's really clacky, okay, you want to change it because it's annoying. But right. sometimes you pop the hood and you're like, hear a little bit of Vanos rattle, and people are like, I got to rebuild it. I'm down in power. No effect on power or whatever. There really? is seals and stuff that can wear out and make it perform worse that is a possibility but i've never seen it it can pretty much when people rebuild them they often make them too tight and they get slower to react anyway but vanos something that move what vanos is it moves the, the cams right on e36 into cam on a e46 it moves both the cams it's for power curve and emissions reasons is it basically like uh, a vtech has that has that um, uh kick on at like 45 i think yeah, it's 40 the vtech pop yeah. um VTEC is a, I think, I don't know exactly. It's like a secondary lobe on yes, the that cam kicks on at a certain that RPM. It like maybe puts oil pressure to a exactly. second set of lifters or right. something else, right? Yep. And then it it moves it up and it's like having a different cam profile it or a larger the cam. It valves in deeper so you get yeah, more some, Okay, more, more lift then more or something? Lift, yes. This is different. The BMWs do have something called Valvetronic, which is variable valve lift. Maybe that's similar. Right. But it's variable. It's always changing. Mm. But vanos is more of cam timing so on e36s it became a big thing a while ago people will talk about um 
I took my intake cam and I moved it to this degree and this degree and it did X, Y, and Z. And right. then I tried to get involved in the chat a little bit and a lot of people were like, I, I didn't agree with what everything everyone was saying. Yeah. And I offered my dyno to people. Like you got to pay for your hotel and shit. You can use dyno. You can play with it. You can learn if you're selling these products. Right. Um, on E46 and three and newer or E46 and newer, I can go in the ECU and change the degree, one degree, the target one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 degrees and see the power difference it makes at mm -hmm. each RPM on the fly. So it does all sort of translate back to an E36, but it's like different cams, different head port. But that's what the Vanos does. It moves cam timing, which effectively changes your power curve. If you shift your into cam completely one way, you're going to have crazy low end. If you shift to the other way, you have crazy top end. Right. Having the on off point or a variable control yeah. gives you the bottom end and the top end. It just effectively um, controlling cylinder pressure. It's like making more cylinder pressure, low RPM versus high RPM. Right. Why does it break all the time? I think a lot of people talk about it more than it needs to be on E46 M3 is the real one that it does break on. Okay. And like break, shit breaks off. Yeah. Messes up your car. The other cars, it gets noisy. Oh, I get it. It's cool. Repair it. Fix your noise. But E46 M3, that's how piece breaks off and causes oh, so a that's problem. A serious, that's a serious problem. Yeah. But like if the car is 80,000 miles or less, I'm not... The chances of it's like pretty slim. Well, I think as time goes on, it becomes a thing where it's like you're going to probably run into that problem because unless you're going to spend a lot of money to get a car with mm. less than 80,000 miles, you know, then yeah. of course you won't have that issue. But most people are probably just picking up cars with 100,000 miles on them and then trying to yeah. do something with them. So most of us are like most of my E36s <laughs> yeah. all got some miles. Yeah. A lot of my cars got some miles. <laughs> so um, have you done any crazy swaps in, in any of these cars like where you... You know, try oh, to stay good. away from the BMW platforms. Because a lot of these E36s, uh -huh. they get swapped out for different yes. motors. That's really good. So I am like, I'm strictly BMW. And I'm okay. not saying it's the best. Like, I'm not dumb. Well, <laughs> I'm dumb because I'm here and I have too many cars. Yeah. But I'm not dumb to tell you BMW is the best motor ever and anything like that. But no, I've never really done a swap in terms of a different engine we've done swaps like here when i was yeah. working on customers cars between e46 like swapping motors between different bmws mm -hmm. but because it's my business for myself it's what i've stuck to okay makes sense not often do i buy cars that are not beneficial also to my business but i also enjoy them i don't have to have e36s that i don't post about that i drive when i want i right. do that because i enjoy it okay um the only thing closest to a swap i guess is like my yellow M240 behind you. Yeah. It's not a swap because that has a B58 engine in a car. And that car came with a B58 from the factory. It's not a swap, but it runs a full standalone. You could take that motor out and put in anything with the wire harness I made. It okay. runs a link ECU. It has direct injection deleted. It is other than like making motor mounts. It has a Tremec TKX transmission from like a Chevy. It has what? a... Clutch bastards, clutch, aftermarket drive shafts. So like other than like the motor mounts being stock, wiring wise, the coolant system has like an old school Chevy radiator that's just massive. It's not a swap, but, but effectively for parts, me, right. there's not a lot of there's probably five B58s on standalone in America. Most of them are like Motec cars, which are big money. Right. This is a fifteen hundred dollar, two thousand dollar ECU, not a ten thousand dollar setup. So you're saying that there's not too many B58s on Motec. So the guys who have the fastest ones, they're not. No, no, those are stock ECU guys. Okay. So I'm saying guys, drift cars. A lot oh, of times, drift like, for drift cars. The stock ECU stuff is probably not the best for drifting when you want to strip the body down, get rid Got of all the you. weight, the wiring, stuff like that. Okay. So I, I, that makes sense. That makes sense. So do you, um, have you ever messed with Motec at all or? No. No, none of those standalone ECUs? Well, my pay grade. Really? No, nah, it's just like <laughs> I, I, I do mostly stock, like, I specialize in stock ECU. Okay. So the thing is, um, I would say this the wrong way. Motec is an extremely time-consuming thing to learn. And He's trying do. to sound whole structure. No, I'm now. trying to be nice. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 no. But it's true. Motec is a very time-consuming thing. Yeah. And to learn and do correctly and do properly, like because there's so much logic that you can do with it. Taking that out of the equation, you want know, like an AM, a link, any of those things. Okay. I do what most people can't with stock ECUs. You can buy a link. There's instructions, how-to guide. Like for me to make that run, anyone could have bought a link. And put it on B58. With their support, they can make it work. Okay. But to make an E36 run with a turbo is not common. So, like, I do... And also, like FADM3, like, years ago, like, testing and um, doing different setups. 
if you like have a Chevy, you go buy HP tuners and yeah. you plug it in, you're a fucking tuner. They give you all the tables. It's way harder for BMWs. Now with like modern things like um, aftermarket tuning tools yeah. that have came out, anyone can actually now tune your own BMW. You can buy a GDM3 right. and uh, download Boot Mod. Boot Mod, I have MHD. Okay. So same thing. I've used MHD yeah. before. I, I've tried a lot of different things. Right. But you buy like, for DIY stuff, some are easier and harder. But like, let's just say you buy like whatever you want to buy. Whichever okay. one. You set it up. You can connect and tune your own car. I'm not saying it's going to work good. But like now you can do that. When I started doing E36s, it wasn't a thing. Right. So I was offering something, even F80s. There was no boot mod. There was no MHD. Like when I single turbo my F80, yeah. there was nothing like that. There was no support. There was no one to call. I had to figure out. So I was doing things that no one else could do mm -hmm. or no one else did do, for example, because now people At have done time, it. Right. So because of that, it allowed, like for me, I'm not just being like, let me go tune a Chevy. <laughs> like why would I like right it's not to say it's easier to Chevy. it might take a lot of work it could take more work than what i'm doing but it's just something that like business wise it's what i stuck to and not everyone could easily hop in and do it right right i thought about doing mercedes i've done random mercedes i've done random porsche i've done random mclaren i've done random cars like stock ecu stuff because once again for me to migrate into that the level of difficulty is not that high mm -hmm. um and also business wise once you figure it out really good on stock ECU, it's easy to replicate. Right. So like it's a good business model, the scalability of it. Like not to sound like I'm just here to like make money. I have BMWs <laughs> because I like them. Yeah. But I like to do things that people can't all do and I can make money. That's Yeah, for the for the longest time I've always stayed away from BMWs. And the main reason is not I know I said before, like I never liked BMWs, but I think for me it was just because growing up it was one of those things where it's like yeah, that shit's expensive mm -hmm. and i don't know for people always said like oh if you if your car breaks down it's gonna be expensive the same thing with mercedes mm -hmm. yeah so i always stayed away and for the longest time i've just always thought like you know what if i ever wanted to put some mods into a bmw it's probably gonna cost an arm and a leg mm -hmm. so i always stayed away has it um and the supra no honestly i've just been chilling man it is bmw <laughs> yeah <B58, laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's i just been chilling bro uh -huh. like i had an issue with where i took my car to toyota mm -hmm. they did an oil change and Apparently, when they get a car, a Supra, and they're supposed to do a check because people were having oil starvation issues mm -hmm. on the newer Consumption ones. Consumption issues. Yep, Consumption, yep. yes. So um, they were um, ordered to do that. Even if you come in for oil change or anything else, they didn't tell me that. They pulled the spark plugs out, put them back in, and broke one, didn't tell me, mm. and made it seem like it was my fault because I had a tune in the car. Mm. So I was driving around. Luckily, uh, Visconti actually was able to figure it out because nobody else could figure it out that it was a tune. And uh, he put new spark plugs in. And then That's it. he said that when you take these out, you're supposed to replace They're them. They're garbage. Yeah. People don't, people don't want to hear that. Right. My F80 M3, when I went fast, yeah. if I had anything questionable without the car, I take the plugs out, they're garbage. And they're not cheap. How much is like 150 or $180? Yeah, dude, that was set. like, it was expensive. There, I was like, damn, bro, this is expensive for some spark plugs. Yeah. yeah. There'd be days on the dyno where like me testing things. Yeah. Two, three, four, five sets. And then I have customers like, oh, I had a misfire and I moved the plug. And I'm like, it's all garbage and people don't want to hear that yeah they're like but they're brand new right and i'm like they were you torque it with a torque wrench every car we've ever done gets torqued with a torque wrench the smart plug and right. then when you're done and they come out they're garbage it's crazy yeah. it's just because they break very easily the ceramic's so thin mm -hmm. in it that's what he so said so when you tighten it the ceramic breaks very easily and then the plug can drop and then if you're lucky it just moves sus but uh it, and then uh <laughs> <laughs> and then uh <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky it moves it doesn't fall into the motor if you're unlucky it can go into the motor <laughs> yeah. like, sus. he ch checked out for a second sus um yeah so um you know what it was i, I agree with you because i was kind of tight because any other car i've had like hondas you take the sprock plugs out you're fine you can just six yeah. clean them dude clean like, them, put them back in yeah you can't i didn't know that so i was like there's no way they could be this sprock plug. i just mm -hmm. this car is brand new bro it's got like i don't even know like seventeen thousand miles i had and I was like, there's no way it's sprock plugs. And then he couldn't figure it out. He's like, honestly, bro, that's the only thing I could think of. Mm -hmm. So then he pulled them, put them back in. Car was misfiring. It wasn't going 40. It was bad. Mm -hmm. Like misfiring. I couldn't go over 40. It was like. Thought your shit was blown up. Yeah. That's what they told me. Mm -hmm. I went back to the dealership. He was like, oh, you know, since you have a tune in the car, we can't do anything. You got to get into motor swap. I was like, bro, are you kidding me? That's crazy. Yeah. All because of an oil change that, you know, turned into a whole spark plug change. So. 
Yeah, but I haven't had any issues, man. I've been chilling. The B58 is a very, a very good, uh, reliable motor. So far, I'm at 60,000 miles. Oh, that's, that's a lot of miles. Yeah, yeah. So I drive the shit out of the car, um, and yeah, I can, I can have fun with it if I want, but I'm chilling, man. I'm not, no complaints at all so far. Besides the oil situation, um, it's good. It's solid. I'm trying to see, like, how it compares to some of the most iconic motors. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, the most common one, 2J, right? Uh-huh. That's the most common thing that comes up. So, um, based on the research, there are some things that obviously, you know, Papadakis, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the PSMO Technos car. Yes. That's one of the people I was think like yes. mentioning of. Yep. Right. So, um, on that, on that car, he's, he's, you know, taken the motor out, built it. He's probably one of the first ones to do it, honestly, at that, at that power level, possibly. Um, but there's a lot of things about that motor that are actually like really good as opposed to like the older BMWs that are like, let's say for example, an open deck. This is a whole closed deck situation. Um, and he mentioned something about some type of plasma coating on the, on the cylinder walls. Do you know anything about that? Sort of, kind of, yes. It, the bad part is that if you have any scuff or any damage right. to the cylinder wall, the block is garbage unless you sleeve it. Right. So can you, but can you sleeve a B58? People do sleeve them. Okay. People sleeve F80 motors. I, I've never done it. Like on, for my G80 motor, which is S58, yeah. I bought a spare that I built. Mm-hmm. If I crack an OEM sleeve and like all the data is good and I just think I made too much power, then maybe you look into sleeving it. Before then, they're um, ridiculously beefy. Okay. F80 M3, 1200 wheel horsepower, stock sleeves, no problem. I once scratched one of those walls though and I swapped the block out. You that's can't what, see, that's what you do, right? Behind you up there, I have four F80 M3 spare blocks. Just random, like someone ha- spun a crank cub, someone broke something, someone bent a valve, yeah. and I would just buy them and collect them. Right. I didn't burn through them all. As you see, I have too many now yeah. to get rid of. But yeah, it's, it's a spray-on liner. They spray it, I want to say like... Um, From factory. Yeah, I want to say it's like something ridiculously thin, like four thousandths of an inch, and then machine out like one to two mm-hmm. on the hone process. You're left with like one to two left. And it's ridiculously thin, so you right. can't hone it. You can almost clean it, sort of, mm-hmm. deglaze it potentially. Right. But if you use the wrong stuff, you're going to have oil consumption issues. Right. So pretty much building a motor that's not blown is really important if you're going to like build a B58 motor. Right. right. Once it's damaged, it's a throwaway. See, that's the only In thing. my opinion. Yeah. yeah no, you that's, can, that's, you can yeah. sleeve it or do whatever you want. I'm not saying it's a bad move. It might be better. I've heard on F80s. I know a few people that sleeved F80 motors yeah. and they swear that it was better because otherwise you're stuck to buying pistons that you hope match the piston to wall clearance. Right. Whereas normally you'll hone and bore the motor out to match. Right. So they say you actually get like a better piston to wall clearance. The motor's less clackety, mm-hmm. especially like depending on the aftermarket piston you buy, the skirt's thinner or fatter. Right. So by like a super thin one, it's more clacky because the piston rocks. Yeah. So like they say though on like the steel wall, it's like better, but I haven't been there. I haven't tested it. To spend three grand, four grand to sleeve a motor, that's like a questionable thing in my mind. Yeah. Um, I'm good for now. <laughs> so the only reason I bring that up is because I am so, I can only speak from my experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know, let's say for Hondas, you know, you can sleeve, mm-hmm. you can sleeve whatever you want. Technically, yeah. you don't have that new, um, that coating that they have. Well, when you sleeve, too. it doesn't matter. When you sleeve, you're cutting that off. Super, super easy to cut it off. But if you're can, a machine shop. If you're right. But then it's like, at that point, like, do you even need to? Because you can make pretty much a thousand. A lot. Like, I don't think people are having block cracking issues. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's it pretty, seems good. But in terms like that versus swapping, because you were saying like swapping a 2J or something. Right. So it's, it's a platform where there's a lot of, um, there's been so many different combinations that have been done already. So it's like, you go to a platform where it's like, even like Honda, you can go to a Honda, get a K20 swap or whatever it is. And don't do that. I'm not saying I'm going to do that, <laughs> but I'm saying like when you look in to try to be different, you know, you, you, you want to swap a motor and like, let's say if you want to do RB26 mm. into a super, like that's a motor that'd be cool to do. But when it comes to parts, yeah. expenses, support availability, in support, America. exactly. So that's what I'm, that's more I'm looking into. Um, now I don't want to be in a situation where I like, let's say for a B58, right. I don't want to be in a situation where like something goes wrong and then, I have to go, but I have to get into the block or something like that. It's like, you know what I'm uh, saying? Probably eight to 10 grand brand new. Eight to 10 grand because it's so new still, right? Um, I don't know why it's like that, but <laughs> if you get the right people, you can buy one brand new for like eight to 10 grand. 
And the, the people online might be like, no, they're 12 or 13. Yeah. If you're in the automotive world and you can find someone that has a good connected BMW, the retail might be 10 to 12. It For might be block? way more. No, I'm talking about head to block. Oh, head to block. Like, if you know the right Nova. people, you can order one through Toyota for that much money which is like it's hard because like if you're gonna build a motor you buy that then you still build it adds up that's my s58 was like eight grand for a spare s58 this is what i'm saying in germany They're it's pricey. expensive but yeah. you think a 2j is gonna be cheaper absolutely not no definitely not yeah, yeah. i'm not i'm looking into different platforms yeah um you really you're really con uh, considering it at some point People would tell me I'm crazy for doing that because a B58 is a very good motor. How comparable is it to a 2JZ okay. in terms of power? You can say, I want a 3,000 horsepower 2J mm -hmm. and call induction performance on the phone yeah. and say, swipe my credit card, and they will swipe. And they will try to achieve that. Even maybe 2,000, 2,500. That recipe for a B58 has not been proven yet. And like you mentioned, Visconti. He's the person selling the motors in the top fastest cars, right? He's right. one of the guys that are doing the top motors. He might tell you, oh, for 2,000 horsepower, I can try X, Y, and Z, or I'm fairly confident X, Y, Z will work, but we'll have to see block rigidity. Maybe the block will start cracking. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll have other issues. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but E36 people are going to hate this, but E36 motor compared to a 2J real quick, a 2J is just so much more proven to go so much further. A E36 has more flaws even though it makes more power and a better power curve the 2j is just so tested to a higher power level mm -hmm. and like block casting wise it's more it's a better block it's compared the biggest, to the yeah. e36 motor and whatever i'm an e36 guy i won't put a 2j in one because mm -hmm. it's good enough for me but it's not a race car b58 though you're gonna have so many issues not just motor wise the motors are relevant because you make like you'll make more than a thousand horsepower well with that if you have a 2j i would want to go for 600 and, and the other like a thousand horsepower is cool yeah, absolutely that's a okay. lot of, that's a lot it's this, a lot mind you this isn't like a daily anymore either. yeah but a thousand horsepower b58 with a zf8 so the rear wheel drive auto trans yeah is beating a stick shift supra absolutely it just depends on what you want right so if you want a stick shift car drive around a thousand wheels too much because the power curve is going to suck it's going to be a little bit lazy you're going to have i don't know if you are you gotta be a driver to actually <laughs> shift the car right and stay in boost. Right. Well, you have to have a good clutch set up mm -hmm. and some level of being able to shift quickly to stay in boost at a thousand horsepower in a manual car. Right. I'm not saying I am. I'm just saying that an auto car is often gonna win. And like depending at on at the your... track. Yes. So well, that's the thing. And it's, like, I'm you, not going. I'm not building a, tr a, tr yeah, a but track car. Even on, you know? no, on the street, auto's winning. Oh, 100 percent. On the yeah. street, you do two shifts. Right. Left hand drive, right hand drive, right, whatever right. you whatever you want. The auto car is so good, and it, the ZF8 with the so many gears and the such close ratio. Even if you have a lazy power curve, you're always in the like your car right now is stock turbo. It shifts at seven thousand. It's at fifty five hundred. Yeah. Right. So you could have the shittiest power curve on a B fifty eight, and pending you can get into boost to launch. Other than that, you got a sick car. The two JZ in my opinion, is going to cost so much money for something that's inferior. Mm -hmm. It's not inferior because it's the worst motor. Right. It's just inferior because you're losing a lot of OEM controls often. You put an aftermarket right. gauge right now. You could buy different things to make it work, but aftermarket gauge. No, I would need a standalone for this yep. whole setup. Yeah. But I'm saying like your gauge cluster probably won't work unless you like. Standalone. Did yep. you like a, yeah, yeah, you need a standalone. Yeah. Is your AC going to work? Like there's guys doing it. There's one guy right now doing a 2J swap in A90. Uh, it's already been done like two years. No, I know, I know, but I know of one guy like he's doing it right now, trying to make AC work. It is um, in New in York. My, I think he's in. I dealt with guy many years ago. Oh, okay, really, okay. really nice guy. He's a red Supra. And that's him. Yeah, that's the same guy. I, I think he's what's in his the, name. I don't know, but I know who you're talking Fast about. Fast something yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Such a nice guy. Yep. He's not tuned by me. Anymore. I don't even think he likes me. But such, <laughs> he's just such a nice guy though. Um, he is doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, a two J swap. I saw the. I saw yeah. yesterday. I think and. It's just cool because it's a 2J and a Supra. Right. Past that is really not that cool. Yeah. Like you can just re you can just put a stick shift in your car right now. Well, they may they already make a. Manual. I know that. Yeah. But like, other than the fact to say I have a 2JZ MK5 Supra. Right. I don't unless you're like I want 2,000 horsepower on a potential platform that's more no on a platform that is more developed. Mm -hmm. It's worth it. Past that, it's not. Um, not even the guy Johan that works for Adam LZ. He's doing a 2J swap because he got a shell with no motor. He knows 2Js. He probably end up with a. He probably got an NA 2J he bought like yeah. 
to buy that motor package when he's doing all the work himself on his spare time could be cheaper. Right. When you have a running and driving car, it's not cheaper. So the differences between the two, you think that uh, a B58 would make, be more ideal technically? For the car, for depending on your use. If you're trying to drive the car around normal, you can convert it to manual easier mm -hmm. than doing a whole swap. And what you're going to achieve by doing the swap is a worse performing car than the auto with like, especially if you're going to spend 15, 20, 30. I mean, if you're not doing it yourself, I would say 20 plus thousand, right? If someone gives you a $10,000 quote, your car's going to live there at that <laughs> shop for the rest of its life. <laughs> so it's like 20 plus grand, whatever it costs for a worse performing car. Just to say you have a 2J. Yeah. That's my look on it. That's fair. I'm, I'm really not looking into doing this, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there are people who get Supras yes. and they're like, that's the most common thing. People who don't know yeah. about uh, cars and you get a Supra, mm -hmm. an A90 or a Mark V, mm -hmm. the most common thing I used to hear when I first got the car was, I'm just going to put a 2J in it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay. I mean, it's still pretty early. We don't even know where the car is yet, but um, that's a lot of time and money. And it's not really, it doesn't seem like it'd be a reliable thing. Now, there is somebody in um, California who has yep. one. Pterodactyl. Um, Pterodactyl, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's know, a fire it. setup, amazing Super looking car, cool. sounds great. But um, I think he was having issues putting the power down because of the, the wheel that he had on the, on, the, um, on the back of the car. I think he could only run like an 11 and a half inch. I mean, uh, that's pretty big. It's big, but his tires, with the, way he, with the way he has his car set up, stands out. It's just not, you know, it doesn't, doesn't yeah. work. But he did you know? it for the cool factor. It looks and don't great. Get me wrong. If you got it like that, yeah, and you want to buy a Supra to do that, more more power to you. Right. Adam LZ has a four rotor Supra because yeah, he wanted that's sick that. Too, yeah, because he wanted that. But right. like, other than the fact of doing it because you want to or because you think it's cool, I don't think it will actually be better. Right. I have a B fifty eight on standalone. It's not because it's better. Right. It's just because I want to do something that was a little bit different. It fits. It tailors your needs. Yeah. Right, 100%. So can you talk about the differences between the B58 and the S58 I will, motors? I will try to say the differences, and then I'll tell you which is best, which is not going to be what you think. Okay. Um, let's start. Okay, so let's start with the comparison so it's uh, clear. That way it makes it easier for okay. people to kind of understand. So let's start with the B58. Mm -hmm. It's key points, key selling okay. points, I guess, from the B58. I don't know. It's going to sound horrible, right? Because I, I know a lot of things technically. I don't know if it's 82, 84 millimeter bore, bore size differences, right? No, just like But the, they're both like yeah. three liter motors. They're both aluminum block. They're both closed deck. The real main difference is, so there's Gen 1 B58, Gen 2 B58, and now there's like a newer one in the brand new cars. It's a okay. little bit different even. But B58 versus S58 from the factory, one makes 400 horsepower, 300 horsepower, one makes double almost right okay 500 horsepower but block wise i don't see either one having a major problem i know mike body said that the b58 block is also using diesels and they're ridiculously strong ridiculously beefy from me looking at s58 looking at it and inspecting it i don't see why the s58 block would be any weaker okay compared to b58 i think the real issue um goes to the cylinder head this is really the really difference wait wait so no rods are an issue no, that is an issue. That is an issue. Bare okay. block, bare block, casting, casting, bare, okay, building casting. it. Okay. okay. Stock wise, okay. Stock wise, everyone says that the S58 rods are weaker. Right. And they break easier. I don't want to say that they're wrong, but I also want to say S58 on stock turbos spools up harder than any B58 does. And the reason why is because every B58 puts a single turbo to make that power curve to make 750 wheel. Okay. No B58 with a pneumatic wastegate, like a, a vacuum operated wastegate, is spooling and making 700 foot pounds torque at 3,000, 3,500 RPMs like the OEM turbos are on a G80 M3. Does the difference in compression matter at all? Uh, in theory, the higher compression could be worse for the rods, but the lower compression motor, the S58, is what everyone says breaks rods more. Right. I think really. Um, what breaks rods is too much torque too early. If that motor makes 700 foot-pounds of torque, 750 at 3,000, if you can shift that to the right and put a bigger and bigger turbo on it, there is no reason why you can't make 850, 900 wheel on a stock S58 with proper tuning. Okay. Side-by-side, side, S58 rods are thinner. They're they're like a little bit weaker. Everyone says the part number cross number references with S... Um, 63 the v8 twin turbo car okay a lot of people that say side by side they're technically different part number stamped on them 
I don't know the truth behind that, but interesting. They, they are a thinner rod. But in terms of like, so yes, in theory, the S58 will handle less, but no B58 is spooling like an S58. And everyone, whether you have a GTR that makes 900 horsepower stock motor or a Porsche that makes 900 horsepower stock motor, nobody is trying to hit low end torque. Everyone comes and boosts slow and smooth and ramps boost up top. Right. Pulls timing out down low, pulls boost out down low. So you re- remove some of the hit on it and add in the torque up top. And according to everyone that does crazy stock motor things, like 800 foot pounds of torque yeah. at 7,000 RPMs is way softer on the motor than 700 at 3,000. Right. So like it's all relative on all that. So if they're making 700 foot pounds of torque, 740 at 3,500 RPMs, I don't see why it can't make 900 wheel, 1,000 wheel with a bigger turbo setup. Okay. The problem is it's just so good with the factory turbos or twins that it's easier to break the rods. On a B58, mm. the factory turbo sucks. And then you put better and better one. Well, there's people, I guess, stock turbo make not 600 foot pounds torque, B58, and doesn't break a rod, don't break rods. The, there's really no... Uh, like turned up to the max. Yeah, there's, so, it's usually turbos that go first, if anything. Yeah, but stock rods, yes. S58 rod is weaker than B58. But when I'm talking about the block, I'm talking about like um, if you were to build it, okay. the difference is. Not really stock versus stock, but yeah, stock versus stock, S58 rod is weaker than B58. But when it comes to building it block wise, I think they're both stout. Okay. Um, they both handle big, like same head stud part number. I'm like 95% sure. Strength wise, block wise, I think it's fine. Crank wise, it's fine. They're not going to break a crank. Right. From anyone seen. The real difference between B58 and S58 when you want to make a thousand horsepower and you want to build a motor and do it is in the cylinder head. And the real, the reason is, S58, they say is a 3D printed partially or 3D printed cylinder head, but that's not anything I care about. You should care about. You should care about. The real difference is every B58 that makes 800 horsepower mm-hmm. blows a head gasket at some point. Every single one. Yes. With stock. And people for years didn't want to talk about this. You have a B58, um, like, I don't want to call names. They would say, my shit's great. My car works great. And then all of a sudden, they, they put out their car and the head's up for sale. And you can see where it's been rewelded, mm-hmm. where it blows out the, the head gasket. Right. S58, the same area that the B58 blows out, the coolant port is like half the size. It blows a head gasket into the coolant port area. Right. So, in my opinion, the structure of the head is not that good. So, under crazy power and crazy load, that's what's deforming. And that's the easiest out for the cylinder pressure. That's why, like, Visconti yeah. sells a $2,000 head gasket. I'm not really talking shit by it. Like, it is a solution. You right. buy it, you put it in your motor, and it stops it from blowing out. Some sort of fire lock. S58 with an O-ring and a stock gasket holds a 1,000 wheel. B58, in my personal opinion, does not. And the more you deck the head, the thinner it gets. Right. By thousands of an inch even. And the more chance you have. So I think, like, the stock motor is untouched. Or the ones like someone did a shitty job in their driveway, yeah. pulled the head off, put pistons in it, put it back on, have less chance of head gasket issues. But S58 has a better head for that reason only. Valve springs like are interchangeable with so many different BMWs. Valve springs. Um, even like for a while, people were using a B58 rod in S58 with a custom piston. That's why I'm not sure on the deck height thing, yeah, but yeah. it is possible it's different. I think it's the stroke that's different yeah. compared to the bore, not right. the height of the deck, but which one's better? Um, I'm buying a G80 M3. Like I have one, right? Yeah. I've had two over a M340 because of all the amenities you get. You can fit bigger tires. It's a nice looking car. It's more aggressive, but like Mike Body just posted, he made a thousand wheel stock B58. Yeah, he's coming for you, bro. No, no, no. <laughs> no he's in his I'm own kidding. league. I'm kidding. He I'm kidding. For, I'm he's in his own league. <laughs> he's, he's, he's actually trying to, um, he's going to do big things with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, that's one of those things, like people say these will never do that. I don't know if these rods can handle that, like 850 pounds of torque or something that he's making. Yeah. But shifting the power curve over helps dramatically. And that's like a stock unopened motor. Doesn't have a head gas issue yet. He's probably tuning it in a way to try to keep it um, all happy. Mm-hmm. But this is a better motor, and these are better parts behind it from the factory. But motor-wise, it's not that different. Like, if you're expecting me to say, oh, the motor's horrible, S58's great, B58, no. The head no, difference... No, both, they both, they're both proven. Yeah, they're both yeah. good. And no matter which one you do, you're going to want a better head gasket solution mm-hmm. compared to just an O-ring or something. Right. Because if you're going to make 1,000, you want to be faster, you're probably going to make 1,200. 
yeah. or 1100. So you're going to want some sort of fire locking ring that, um, that Visconti sells or like, I have a different style one that I'm putting in my G80 M3 motor, which I think is going to work just as good. Yeah. I don't want to say better because like his shit is proven and my shit's a slightly different. I haven't seen his, but mine's a different design based on people that mess with it. Yeah. And I think it's going to be as good of a head guess solution as I could come up with okay. for the car. But motor-wise, they're not that different. So what about the head studs? Do you think that... Same. You can you can take B58 head studs and put it S58. No, not not stock, though. I'm saying uh, let's say if you wanted to go for bigger head studs and a B58. I don't think that you... That way you can... Okay, like, I don't think you need a big... Like, if people... I don't think the head stud is having an issue with Okay, it. so they don't and lift. The head's not lifting off of the block. I don't think the head's lifting. Okay. And here's why, right? When it comes to best BMW motors, like you said, what's better, B58, S58? Mm -hmm. They're both here, but F80 M3 S55 is here. <laughs> S55 is a better motor than B58 or S58. Why is and this? Oh, no wow. one, and then the, here's the, <laughs> no one's going to believe this. The reason why is F80 M3, and everyone say crank up, crank up, crank up, crank up. Like, I get it. F80 M3 motor, ARP 2000s from an Evo 10. Studs. Like like Evo ARP two thousand and you have six twenty fives which are more expensive fancier like that's all the B fifty eight S fifty eight guys use is mm -hmm. a eight hundred dollar headset kit right yeah three hundred dollars worth of headsets no no L what is it L nineteen uh, same same thing okay same thing okay. effectively um there's some to say that they're different one's coded or something mm -hmm. and maybe technically they're like a tiny difference F eighty motor with two three hundred dollar Evo ten head studs right okay. Like you buy three Evo 10 kits and you get one half F80 motors worth and an OEM head gasket, 1200 wheel horsepower, never, ever head gasket issue ever. I had zero head gasket issues in the life of my car. And there are so many shops out there that have no idea what they're doing with F80 motors and motors in general. Okay. And they put pistons and rods. They're going to like melt a piston because they have no idea what they're doing with cars, but they don't have head gasket issues. So like when you look at like the cost of like, what is a better motor? Okay. A crank hub does cost, let's say retail a thousand dollars that you have to do when you're building a motor. Anyway, it's easier for you and your driveway to drill four holes with a fixture. That you really can't mess up. Right. Versus having to get a block machine by machine shop to have receiver grooves put into it mm. for the crazy head gasket. So you're talking about 2000 hour head gasket, 800 hour head suds or 600 hour head suds versus an OEM head gasket. No O-rings, nothing fancy. And three hundred dollar head studs, but a nine hundred dollar crank hub. What's better? And like a lot of people can say, there's not that many people out there doing twelve hundred horsepower in F eighty. Yeah. It's like I'm in a uh, uncharted territory. It's because other people aren't there yet. They haven't figured out how to make everything else work in the F eighty. Right. But motor wise, if what's a better engine, F eighty. What is a better car? Not. I'm sorry. S fifty five is a better engine, but F eighty M three is not the better car. The all-wheel drive system in the other cars are better. Okay. F80 M3 will never be a B58 car or an S58 car. It can't be. The drivetrain kills it. The DCT sucks for launching. Yeah. But like motor-wise, what's the best BMW motor that they've came out with in a long time? S55. Like what other car? Like B58 is not even in the category in my opinion. <laughs> and like, and like oh, what's yeah. the best? I was not expecting you to yeah, say that. No one, no one is. <laughs> Everyone's like, B50, F50, the best. They've just been given an amazing opportunity that F80 hasn't. And it being in the Supra also gave it a better opportunity because no one would have been doing what they're doing with them. What about the M340, though? Uh, that's B58, same thing. It's still. Yeah, but it's not in the Supra. What do you mean? Like it's a B fifty eight. It's um, it's not in a Supra. So like let's say if you said it's 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 no, a better opportunity. If Supra it's, being that it came in a Supra, people went out of their way and pushed it. Well, no, they were pushing them three forties before the Supra. No, no. Like okay. or three forties. I, I got three forties. If there was not, if it did not come in a Supra, I don't know if like talking about fast fuel, Mike Body would he have bought a a BMW and pushed it? He was doing STIs and stuff, like making a living doing other cars. It's because a Supra name brought the people and pushed the platform. My F80 M3, I built the car, right? I had issues along the way. I talked okay. to you. Car caught on fire because I rushed before an event and rethreaded a spark plug hole. Mm -hmm. And the thing I rethreaded with melted and literally fuel came past it like crazy. But I had an F80 M3. Over time, it reset all the records again and again and again. I was by myself. There was no competition. 
It was like the car would get parked here in the shop where we we're sitting for six months collecting dust. And then I'd be, all right, there's an event. I'm going to go do this event. I would go, maybe the car would have a launch issue with the DCT that always sucked for launching. Yeah. There was no technology for transmission tunes yet. So it's factory launch control. So it was like always a struggle, right? Either way, the car would like reset 6130 record. It would go fast. What's, what's the record? Uh, I reset it. I was the first one to five, first one to four, first one to three, 6130. I went, I want to say 387. Someone now beat me. Mike from Max PSI went, I think, 367. Okay. 6130. And in terms of quarter mile, and he's also talking about people that can beat me. This is draggy runs or? Draggy. Okay. 6130. Talking about people that can beat me. He can beat me. That's like a friend of mine for since I've started tuning. He is a good drag racer. He knows how cars work. That car went 9 1 at like 160. My car. Okay. To 2020, I want to say, or 2021, in January. Um, two and a half years, no one touched it. Mike from Max PSI trapped higher, but no one's gone faster than 9 1. Someone in Russia put an all, talking about all wheel drive swaps. They put an <laughs> all wheel drive swap from some other BMW okay. into the car, and they went 0. 0.05 faster than me. So, do they have the record? If they do, they have the record. If right. I have the, it's still a swapped, it's not a, normal bmw like it's not right. a bmw comes with dct right it's like if you take an m340 and put a th400 you could have a fast m340 but are you really the fastest m340 well factory parts you mean that's a sort of kind yeah. of like bmw drivetrain type thing versus okay. if you make the car all wheel drive it sort of takes a little nah, bit away from I, it I, I i mean the for the car yes is it yeah but in terms of like having the fast f80 it's right. not really the same flex right not the same level of flex right. so right, i'm right, still right. gonna flex but I'm gonna say this guy did his thing. I'm still gonna flex. <laughs> but it was it was like a lonely world. Yeah. In the F80 world, I was the only like Mike from Max PSI went went set a record went like nine three or nine four with like mm -hmm. upgrade twins. Once I set the draggy records and was figuring out the launch and then broke the quarter mile time, the car had no use. I literally parted out. <laughs> got rid of it he said parted out I, there was there was there even now to this day there's people that like post online fastest here fastest in arizona and whatever yeah and like everyone wants to talk about my tuner has the record for 85 with a blue car and like gold wheels or whatever and it's all like a joke because when you look up the the highest level of what it is yeah that's when someone is able to do the unlimited like they're able to do whatever they want right right so like on f supra would if it was just M340, it would be those cars would be a second slower. Something's horrible if there was no Supra, in my opinion. You don't think so? I and mean, I I do I do I yeah. do agree with you somewhat when mm -hmm. it comes to the B58. Um, but okay, uh, you, yeah, I guess you kind of have a valid point there because nobody was really breaking records. I guess the same way Body's pushing that car if it wasn't for yeah. the Supra. I, I do agree. Now he actually. Is working more on the on the gen. I think a gen one he has. He's doing all of them. No, yeah, he's, he's doing, doing good all with all of them. them. Yeah. But in my opinion, if it wasn't for the Supra, people wouldn't have pushed the B fifty eight to the same level in the speed they did. Yes, right. Just because of of the name itself and the car. People and, don't like yeah. Supra. People are building and spending more money than the average BMW person. Right. Because they're like they bought a Supra. A lot of times, older dudes were like i wanted a supra i now bought one i'm in a mod it's very common versus a lot of times the bmw owners no disrespect it's all like people leasing their cars yeah they want to do basic stuff to it i was there at least my fast f8 in the world was a lease my car was leased i just yeah, bought it out. yeah yeah it's fine yeah i just literally bought it out in august so, so. um so if they put a b58 in that car let's say an, M an m3 mm -hmm. nobody would be trying to push the platform just because of the m3 name you like, know what i'm saying no why not Cause like look at the M look at the M3 name right now with the F80 that like people did back then even right now there's probably like ten thousand horsepower F80s and none of them work. Everyone's like I'm making them for power. There's like probably more no not probably I can say guaranteed. There's guaranteed more stock motor B58s that went nines than F80s period. And that's the F80 okay. name that car's been out for years longer. Yeah. Okay, that's a that's a fair statement. So, how do you feel about that statement when it comes to BMWs aren't race cars? Because now you're making it more clear that like just because of 
the name, people are pushing the B58 platform. But before that, what cars were there that were like proven to be race cars that can compete with American muscle? Nowadays, with where cars are, where BMWs are, having the all-wheel drive BMW is way better than having the American muscle. Because the Super came out and people like, wow, B58 is great, even though it is what it is. You need a head guess, you have fancy shit to make all this power. But... <laughs> It's a great all-wheel drive platform that leaves really good and is usable. Okay. If you want to talk about my Chevy, whatever, or what LS. does he have? Uh, LS, whatever. These rear-wheel drive cars that are useless on the street. I don't know about you. How many times? Well, how many times have you drag raced your car at the track? I, not never. Not okay. Car. Never zero times. Right. I've been there four or five times. Right. Okay. You put 60,000 miles on your car. Mm -hmm. Talking about this is not a real race car because the real wheel, sorry, the all wheel drive BMWs or even your car, the ZF8 HP is sick. The right. way that power, that car puts power down is very good. The way an all wheel drive BMW puts power down, that's what I'm driving seven days out of the week. It okay. hooks to have a car that you want to say, oh, at the drag strip, it does this and that. And I'll race on a prep surface only. All that is like, it's all bullshit. It's just a flex for the internet. <laughs> it is. It's like you having a car that can just throw down on like any road. And like, I don't street race. Yeah. I am not a street racer, but having a car I can drive to work floor and have it just dead hook from 40 to whatever mile per hour is legal <laughs> nah, to whatever, right? Is that's where it's at for me. So to yeah. say it's not a race car. What is a race car? I can take a gutted E36 and go drive around Lime Rock and say, I own a race car. And it is more of a race car mm. than any car in this room. But that is not, that's not a flex to say it's not, a, you know? Yeah. Yes. American also cars can more easily be made into full-blown drag race cars. The answer is yes. But the reality is you're not doing that. I'm not doing that. We have stock transmissions in our cars. Yeah. Like, you could do that with any car the same way. You can buy the TH400. You can buy the whatever transmission you want. You can put a solid rear axle on any of these cars. But yeah, Coyote is whatever. But like all these <laughs> motors, like LS, whatever, it's easier, I guess, to make crazy power. But it's not just that. More people are willing to go to that level. The BMW guys aren't doing that. But if you look at every single recorded and posted BMW time, mm -hmm. like when, when you're in it like me and you see all the times always, and the progression yeah and you see like mike from max psi just beat everyone with a lower powered car because he figures out how to launch it figure out how to get it to leave like all that you know what the fastest is right and then you have a goal to beat he was the car to beat so like it wasn't like it's like um when you have the fastest of stock turbo and this and that it's really wishy-washy because okay. you have the fastest on stock fuel system with only rear seat removed what the hell? But when you're like the fastest, like right now, G80, who's the fastest? M like hands down undisputed. Uh, Merrick. As of the time of this, Merrick and Powerhouse. There's no, there's no confusion of records. Right. Anyone in the world can look it up. Merrick is the fastest. On F80, I hold, I mean, unless all-wheel drive guy got me, the ET time I hold and the mile per hour might beat me by like a mile per hour too. But like ET, I hold that. So like that's why I'm saying I know I'm the I know I was the fastest for like a while. I had not like it's like draggy time. So it's so dumb, but so I had the 6130 record on manual G80 for mm -hmm. like a year and a half. I had a JB4, which I don't suggest port injection. That was it. Yeah. No mods. If I had full 85. Yeah. And it had, and like everyone was scared to shift the car, right? No one wanted to just flat foot shift, click a three to four and drive the car. So yeah. you had guys like more mods, more what it was cool. Right. But like at the end of the day, I'm not doing that anymore. My goal is with my goal, my G80 also is to be the fastest. It is not to be the fastest in any category, just overall. Okay. So you have, you have a twin turbo situation going on back here, yes. right? which is very bizarre looking. <laughs> uh, there was great purpose for it to put the turbos out of the hood and like big flames and shit with FADM three. I spoke about nothing on the car. I built the motor. I single turboed it. The car was down. I did all the work myself. Okay. In my shop at the time, we just tuned cars and no mechanical stuff. And I worked on the car myself. I did everything. A friend did the fab work and stuff though. I don't do fab. And then car worked, car made a bunch of power. Then I posted it. Okay. 
I look back and I look at other people that just straight talk shit all day, every day online that get so much clout from it and do nothing. All they're doing is like in the BMW world, there's so many shops just chat, chat, chat about how they're the best, how their tuners the best. And then the reality, if, if the people open their eyes, there's nothing going on there. Their tuner might be good. They might be an okay shop, right? But what makes you the best? It's a good question. What makes you the best if your uh, tuner is great? And- if you're if you're like a tuner or you're a shop, having hands down fast is undisputed is what makes you. You can easily say I'm the best at working on these cars currently. You know, like who's gonna say Merrick sucks? That'd be like a little crazy if you're like I'm a G8 owner. Merrick sucks. You can't do that because he right now is the standard. Right. Like not the standard, it's the highest level. Yeah. So, so the reason on the F80, I posted nothing, talked about nothing. It did a crazy build on it, made a thousand plus horsepower. And then, um, after posted it very minimally, I gained X amount of people's awareness. Unless you're a diehard F80 owner. Yeah. Maybe you didn't see the car. Like it did have an exhaust going out the hood, right. but in a normal picture, it would look pretty normal. Mm-hmm. So unless you really like dove into it on the G80 M3, I said, screw this. Everyone wants to say it loud and proud that they're the best. I'm going to not just um, crush like everyone's hopes and dreams on the G80 platform. I'm going to have a car set up that attracts everyone's attention. So whether or not you're searching fastest G80 or crazy G80, I want you to see me. Okay. That's why I did turbos out the hood. They can fit under the hood. Super easy. Like that's a really expensive car. But like <laughs> people don't realize you buy a spare hood. It's a lot. But if you're going to spend... 50, 60, 70, 80,000, 100,000 dollars on a car. A thousand dollar hood in the grand scheme of things <laughs> is whatever. Right. It's so like there's no hood on it right now, but there is a spare hood that's paint matched and ready to rock and roll. Um, and that's why I did it out of the hood. It's not because it's more efficient. It's not because it's better. It's just for the flex of like when you see me, you're gonna know. <laughs> like, right? Like you've seen the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It got a ton of views everywhere. But it's not just for that. It's not to do that and leave a stock motor in it and just be like, my car's crazy. No, it's so that you see that you know me, and then you're gonna know me also when the car goes very, very fast. Is it functional though with those two turbos? The car worked totally fine. It made I think 690 wheel stock motor pump gas, which okay. once again, it's not. I don't want to say it's a highest power on pump. I have no idea. Right. But usually you need like 85 to make 700 plus wheel on those cars. On the S58. Yes, like stock turbo does 600 wheels good. 600 wheel on pump gas is like really good in that. I made almost 700, but that's irrelevant. That was just a test to just see the power curve Right. before I tore the motor out. I just wanted a video of it on the dyno. I knew that tearing the motor out, like I dropped the transmission off of Pure Drivetrain Solutions. They're the best. It's like a few day turnaround time. Yeah. I'm not that fast when it comes to the motor, ordering the head gas guy I need, doing all that. So mm-hmm. like they banged that out for me amazingly, but the weight is on me. Like I ordered... Um, Custom head gasket. It was wrong. Ordered another one. Like that's a, that was a month and a half right there. Damn. Of of delay. Right. And that happens with a lot of things when you're building cars. Mm. So it is happening. It is working. Finally, I feel like I see the finish line in sight. Like the motor is getting there. I just got a uh, part earlier today. But hopefully in the next, let's say like month, I hope to achieve my power goals. And the posted power goals are like 1,500 crank. Like 1,350 wheel is my posted power goals. So we'll you, see where I stop. I'm not <laughs> stopping below that though. So you're trying to have the, the, the highest horsepower. I want to have the highest horsepower and the fastest. With this setup right now. With any setup on any one. Like, it's hard to say. My F80, I like didn't want to tear all the interior out. Didn't go crazy. I pulled about 50 pounds hidden out of the car. That mm-hmm. You can't see when you just look at it. Right. And I had two aftermarket front seats in it. Still had a rear seat in it when I went that time. I could have pulled out 100, 150 pounds. Of, I could pull out 100 pounds of blind weight. You couldn't see it. But I just didn't think like that. Yeah. I do now. On this car, I'll be doing everything that most people won't be. Like, there's okay. people right now that track running 890 right. in a G8X or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the cars have no seats in it. One carbon bucket. Carbon fiber doors. Shit that like, if you see my, I'm not buying carbon fiber doors, but if you see me, no door panels on my car is what it is. Cause I'm not buying carbon fiber doors, you know? (laughs) So I'm going to just do what most people aren't willing to. Like I'm going to take a little weight out of the car. Okay. And I'm also going to risk it a little more. I'm going to 
put turbos that should handle more power. Right. And hopefully with the many years of doing this and learning, I will be able to put it together in a way that from the start to finish, it will just work. Like my F80, I didn't go through five turbos. I bought one turbo for that car. That was the first Damn. single turbo I bought for that car. And my goal was like a thousand, thousand fifty wheel when everyone else making 800. I bought a turbo to make 1200. That same turbo yeah. made 1200. No problem, no rebuild. That turbo keeps on someone else's car right now. That motor, F other than my fire situation, yeah. that same bottom end is in someone's car right now. A normal guy, a guy named uh, Isaac. He drives a train station, six shift, makes 770 wheel horsepower. So, like, I have an idea of what it takes from years of tuning people's cars. I right. see the good and the bad, and I've learned. What's what? I surround myself by with uh, smart people, mm -hmm. sometimes smarter than me in certain situations. And because of that, I hope that the setup I'm choosing for this car works. Can you... Uh, not hope. It's not a guess. But. <laughs> so what is it a built motor? Fully built? Yeah. So it's it's also nothing too crazy. Once like We'll see the limits of the block. It's a fancy head gasket. Like I was talking about the, the right. one. Not from Visconti, but some sort of fancy head gasket. Right. Um, more like diesel engines run. Mm -hmm. They run like what's called a hoop or something, and it locks into the head and the block. But with it being aluminum on both sides, it's a little bit different design. But it's like a hoop. It can't blow out pretty much. You'll right. melt down the whole motor first before wow. you have a head gasket problem. Okay. Good and bad. That um, semi-heavy-duty pistons, semi-heavy-duty rods, um, heavy-duty wrist pins, non-OEM bearing clearance on the main and the rods, ARP main studs. What else? I think I said uh, 625 like custom age head studs. Yeah. Um, aftermarket valve springs. Mm -hmm. And I did order cams. I okay. did order like um, aftermarket cams. Mm -hmm. I don't know how good or bad they'll be. A lot of people's results seem to be very good. Okay. So I bought cams for it. My F80 though, stock head, stock cams, valve springs. Like pistons, rods, crank hub, Evo 10 head studs, valve springs, my F80. This one, I'm also not porting the cylinder head because okay. if I melt it down, right, I can just take another cylinder head and just slap her right on and <laughs> not worry about like retuning, lead time for a cylinder head. And you just need more boost to make the same power with right. a stock head versus ported. So if you're like a pump gas warrior, ported helps. If you run 85 and you get a big enough map sensor, it doesn't help as much. What what about fueling and with the cams? Because you have the uh, the 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 fuel pumps, the high pressure fuel pumps. Yeah, right? that, so does that does that does that have any effect when you change your cams out? I hope that the cam manufacturer makes a OEM size driven piece. I hope it's not overdriven or okay. pumps anymore because these cars already have a problem where like if you drive too much direct injection, yeah, the cam hitting the lobe, right. It takes so much force that the cam gets drawn backwards and can't hit the cam timing target on these cars. On like high ethanol content. Wow. So like you really need supp supplemental fueling. So it will have. So I got rid of the factory air to water intake manifold. Mm -hmm. I put a big front mount on the car. You can't see it. I mean, it's in pictures and stuff online. Um, I put a big front mount intercooler on the car, and I bought a uh, Wagner tuning or Wagner performance mm -hmm. selling air to air super manifold. I put on my car to run an air to air intercooler. No coolant lines, none of that. Bringing ice to the track. It will not be as efficient. Right. But I think it's going to be good enough. I know it's going to be good enough. It's just like um, there's certain things I've chosen along the way that are not. Some of them are expensive. Mm -hmm. Like pure. There's potentially cheaper option for a trans, but you just want it to work, right? Yeah. I buy you a pure stage tree, torque converter, T case. You pay the man. Shit works. Right. There's certain things on this car that I could have spent five, six thousand dollars on an intake manifold mm -hmm. with intercooler built into it. And then bought an ice tank, bought a bigger front mount in like a rad eater thingy and spent, let's say seven to 10 grand. I bought a sub $1,000 in, um, intercooler, like a massive treadstone. Yeah. I think it was like 600 bucks, a maybe $1,500 intake manifold and had piping made. So Damn. like, even if I'm down 50 wheel horsepower, I mean, if it's really, really hot day, maybe I'm down a hair more. Right. Um, I have to pick and choose. A lot of people think it's like unlimited money for me. Yeah. And like everyone else, you have to pick and choose right. how you want to get there. So maybe after piping everything, I'm at four grand, five grand. And I think it's a less headache of a setup to do what I did. So like there's a lot of things like that I do along the build. Right. So I'm trying to be the best. 
So before we move on to the next uh, questions or set of questions, can we talk about the the fueling? Because yes. Um, it was a bit controversial on one stock's episode where he mentioned that he can make 700 on. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So can you talk about how much power you can make on a stock B58 high pressure fuel pump? A lot of it is based. First of all, it's not 700. Obviously, they commented after saying that like that was 700 with a bunch of meth. Meth. Right. I think they were saying yes. and like, yes, that wasn't uh, expressed. And that is a huge thing. You can run 500 horsepower with the meth mm-hmm. potentially. But. Um, power wise, a lot of it depends on ethanol content. I do not know the exact maximum numbers. I'm gonna be super honest with you. On G80, I have an idea, but it's not the maximum numbers of the pumps. It's because it draws a cam back that okay. if you target more or run the, here's the other thing. Like all these guys, I'm going to give you the wrong answer, but hopefully it, it satisfies the question. A lot of it's based on the tuning and I don't say that in a good way. I might make 400 horsepower Mm -hmm. on the same fuel pump setup than the next guy makes 460 horsepower. And you might think like, why Jordan, you're the best, (laughs) but no, but you might be like, why are you gonna make less? Maybe the other guy is willing to risk a little bit more and run the car a little bit leaner. Okay. If I'm at 12, two or 12, four air fuel, maybe he's at a 13, two. Right. And then it's like, if you do that, and you pull 10% fuel out, you can run a little bit more boost and get a little bit more power. So like to figure out the limit of the fuel pump, I really think talk like talk to your, t- it's not 700. I don't know if it's 450 or something like that, yeah. or some sort of ethanol blend, but E20 versus E40, when you're at the limit is a big difference. The same thing on the TU pumps. The No matter what, these cars need often, even on stock turbo, need supplemental fueling. Okay. So really, G80, you can make... Uh, G80 has two pumps. So like you run E40 or something and you can make pretty much max out the turbo. B58, you can run E40 probably and do pretty good on the stock turbo. Yeah. On the Gen 2 pump, the TU pump. Right. But to really make the maximum, you need port injection. Mm. In my opinion. So I'm not giving you an exact answer because I don't really know. A no, lot no, of, that's that's, a, that's, that's yeah. a fact. The port injection thing is definitely a, a fact for sure. A that's lot of what point. I do is like um, from tuning, I don't like to guess. Like a lot of it's like you check, you test, you learn. Mm-hmm. So like, I'd rather just tell you, I don't know exactly. Like same yeah, thing like bore stroke wise, whatever. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. Right. I could tell you more technical things, probably better right, right. than the things you could read. Fair enough. Fair enough. So what I want to talk about is your, your, your content creation, um, like journey because okay. you hang out with a lot of people who are big YouTubers, right? So you're close friends with Adam LZ, um, back when, before, um, I mean, he's always been kind of a big deal, but he's been here a couple of times when you were at the shop on, in, uh, Lindenhurst, correct? Yep. Back and forth when he was doing the, um, I forgot what car he had at the A90 time. A90 Supra. Yes. The Supra, the white one, right. That he gave away. Correct. Yep. So, um, can you talk about how you guys are, you know, close and yes. how that's led to all these other yep. opportunities and things you've, you've had? Yeah. Try not to get too deep backwards, but the same, the guy Chelsea Nofa I told you about. Yeah. I used to tune his pro FD car in formula drift, like a BMW in formula drift. We, told you, we ran nitrous on it, tried a whole bunch of things. I've stayed friends with him through the years. Okay. That's, um, he and Adam are friends cause they both did BMX. Adam used to be a big BMXer. Mm. So I guess that maybe Chelsea got him into drifting, I think. So they became friends. So when Adam got a Supra, Chelsea told him, Hey, hit up Jordan. Ah, uh, okay. For whatever you need for your Supra, he right. will take care of you. So, I got a blue check mark in my DMs. It was Adam LZ. And it was like, hey, I need help with whatever. What can you do for me? So I just tried to do my best. Right. And that was like, there was no XHP for the trans. There was no great way to log what the torque channel was of throwing the torque limiter to know it was a trans, like trans limp mode and stuff like that. Right. But that's how we met. And I mean, we became friendly. At first, like first time I met him, he was down here for a day or two. Second time he was around here, he like, Slept at my house for a day, just like in, <laughs> in passing. Yeah. And then we became friendlier and now I get invited to things with YouTubers right. to go do like drifting events and stuff. Mm-hmm. But when I met him, I didn't do that. Right. When I met him, I just tuned cars, um, tried building fast BMWs, tuned fast BMWs for customers mm-hmm. and tried building fast BMWs. And then over time, my life has rotated into enjoying drifting he was already drifting at the time. Right. He's been drifting, I think, a lot more. 
And then that side of our life's mesh. So like I've gone down there before to hang out and bullshit and drift and I'll connect to his car and do something or whatever yeah. to help out. But that's sort of how we met and how we meshed. And then from that, I've now been able to do things that like, if you're a drifter and you watch, or you're a person likes YouTube, like you people out there, you're going to watch Adam LZ on YouTube. I luckily get to go to a lot of the cool events on almost the other end. Like there's some events. I went to the LZ thing in Ireland. Yeah. I didn't post. I posted on my story. I don't even think I posted a picture of it, mm. a video of it. I drove a right-hand drive 350Z. Changed my life, by the way. <laughs> I'm not a Nissan guy, not a 350Z guy. They sound horrendous. If you have one, keep your stock muffler. But it changed my life because I was like, this is such a basic thing. Yeah. Had some angle kit on it. And I was like, the content side, though, I suck at the content creation side. I think I have good ideas and good things I want to do, and some of it does really good. Like you were mentioning one of them you saw earlier, like a dumb reel, right? Yeah, and with the, the dyno, yeah. Yeah, the dyno reel. And then <laughs> the G80, I was like, this is going to do good and go viral for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things that I'm good at in terms of the content side. But for me, I do enjoy it. It does help the business on the back end okay. one way or another. You found me. You said you first heard of me through... Well, seeing I, my yeah yeah well I, I met you at when you were at back uh -huh. at at mo's shop um around the time when you were actually tuning his car when when yep. he had the when he first got the supra i'm um, not sure why i went there i think mo introduced me to you uh -huh. and then we spoke for like an hour uh -huh. about random stuff mm -hmm. um but then after that i i saw your 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 logo on yep. 8080s giveaway car yep. the first supra which is the reason why i bought mine it's just crazy yeah it's crazy it all works around but like yeah so for me, me doing all those things with like them or like Adam LZ right. has to help me one way or another. People see my face. They know who I am more and more. Mm -hmm. I'm not like famous on how popular I am, but like it's just good to be around. But that was never my intentions with it. I posted a YouTube video before I met him. Yeah. Um, and I was just sucked at it. Right. Because you do when you start, maybe <laughs> you know, it's, your first videos are always like, you yeah. know, terrible. They say like post 50 or 100. I'm not there yet. Post 50 or 100. That's a lot. That's a lot though. Before, well, if yeah. you post like two a week or something you're learning you do it for a year you'll hopefully figure your shit out hopefully, hopefully. yeah yeah maybe not <laughs> so i did that I, I met him side of that and then um i just saw his crazy progression upwards throughout it and luckily i get to go to all these cool things like i because i do drifting if i didn't do drifting i could just show up i think like i'm good, good enough friends with him now to just like i do just show up anyway half the time <laughs> but because I do drifting, it makes it more of an easy thing. Right. Like I can just, like I went to Canada to the LZ Canada thing. And like I went, I drifted. Not great driving, but I did, did some driving. <laughs> Came home and that, I think, brought us closer together. But not just him. Like I have other friends that do YouTube and stuff. Right. Because of that end. Because right. of the driving. But it's weird how it works. Like I try to do things that progress my business. Mm -hmm. and tuning and stuff like that. And marketing, for example. That drifting side was not the intention. I always watched it. I bought this yellow E36 behind me right. six, seven years ago with the intentions of like, oh, I'm going to drive it. I put an Anglican on it, never drove the car. Zero street miles. I drove from my old shop here. That's the only time it's ever been driven in like seven years. Wow. And because of the whole drifting and being around everyone with the drifting, I have a purpose for these, for like, for that car at least. Mm -hmm. And it is a good time going to hang out with the YouTuber crowd of people. Yeah. And it's not because like, I'm not gonna say like, these are guys are the coolest people in the world or the, like they're not, the, I'm not saying this is the coolest guy I've ever met. It's more so a fact of they do things that are different. Like me to go to Japan, like you yeah, spoke that's, about. That's dope. I went to Japan in, in April, maybe ish. I don't know. Whatever, like six months ago and now to go to Japan two times in a year to go drifting with people. And just hang out it is a wild thing to do once in your lifetime, let alone I am lucky enough yeah. to be at a point where I can do that and keep my customers happy and try to manage it all. Right. So that's the whole, that's how I got into the YouTuber thing and hanging out with them. And I could post more and the people probably want to see more like people, if they like me and they enjoy me, they probably want to see more and I probably could do more, but it's a balance. I like right. to enjoy myself, enjoy my life. I see the great stuff that they deal with. I see the struggles at the same time of like, I need to capture this moment. Yeah. But the bigger YouTubers are better at it. You don't see them on their phone. Like they're not recording the whole time at all. They're oh, because recording. they know what moments to catch. They're, they know what they have to record. Yeah. Or right. like 
oh damn, you know what? This guy's wheel just fell off. Look at this guy. Like you might you might see little clips like that, but it's not forced. It's yeah. A lot of people when you first try recording for YouTube, you're, you're recording, recording everything. Hours. Yeah, you're you recording everything. You're doing. Yeah. I'm not that good, but I'm good enough that like if I'm recording it and I'm editing it or who's ever editing it, there is mi like I'm recording what I want to talk about, and then a little B-roll, and then that's it. I try not to sit there for hours. Yeah, no, it's tough. Yeah, you're right though because um we so me and my girlfriend we we um we go to this other youtube couple that we have they're actually our friends now so sim similar it's like adam's big youtubers yeah. big youtubers mm -hmm. yeah they have like a, over a million subs um but they're they're a couple so they have they pretty much post everything mm -hmm. but when we're with them it's like when they're vlogging they know what to record mm -hmm. and i've i've been filming for like eight years and for me it's so hard to vlog because it's like should i get this should i record this i don't know maybe you know what let me just record it and then when i get home like what like mm -hmm. what did i record just like me talking about yep. random shit so um, they know what to record. And it's almost like, did you guys even get enough to film? Yep. And then when they put the videos out, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, shit, they did. Like, they actually Because three used. minutes, five times is yeah. 15 minutes. And you're like, there's no way. Right. But I've been with Adam for work has kind of the dino. He'll record a few minutes. Like, he's, he's, he's a good YouTuber, I'd hope. He's got so many. He's got so much content now. He's, he should know in, the ins and outs. Yeah, of it, like, right? we'll dino for a while. And he's like, yo, like. It's good to dino every pull. God, but something catastrophic happens. Yeah. And there has been times where he'll have his video guy just like literally print, put the camera on and record. Right. And then like stop it if something bad happens, so you know, whatever. Yeah. But most of the time it's like we're, we're going to chat as I'm doing it or whatever, show a dino pull or two, and then like we just work. Right. The same thing with him. He's a good YouTuber because he's been doing it. Yeah, he's been doing it for so long. Um, He's one of those OGs. I don't even know how, how long he's been doing it. But um, do, do you think that like aside from that, is there any other like – tips that you have picked up from them or any strategies that can help your business or any way or you know when it comes to creating content or even just um here in general not necessarily but it's very interesting i always like to talk to people about business even if it doesn't help me in any way right to see what other people are doing how good they're doing it um not to see like what they could be doing better but i always just like to see like i'm always prog i try to always progress in my life okay and it's not a it's not a straight line. It's like stairs. Like right. you do a lot and you feel like you got nowhere or whatever. Like, and then it's always a progression. So I love seeing different people. I do talk to different people like him and other people sometimes about like, I, I ask people for their opinion on different things, but mm -hmm. it is cool to see different people's progression over time. Right. And how good or bad they're doing it. Cause right. I have like different levels of friends and like some people like struggle to get ahead. I do too. I don't know about you, but like you're right now, like, I'm on your podcast. You're on the <laughs> growth. You're doing good, right? But like, yeah. I don't know how you feel, but like, there's times where like you have to figure out what, um, how to progress and go forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what you said is exactly what I go through. Um, literally, like every every single person, whether they're uh, you know in my niche of of business or content, I always try to learn something from everybody. So when we go to um, Trisha and Cam, that's the couple that um, I film their videos for sometimes. They have certain things that they do because as a youtube creator you only get paid once a month so you have to branch out and do other things whether it's merch whether it's sponsorships so you have to find those different ways to bring income because you don't want to do all this for free you have to pay overhead equipment um so for me i'm i'm in that phase where i'm trying to learn mm -hmm. this is this is new to me like doing this getting paid once a month yeah and it's not it's not the money that people think you can have four or five million views and it doesn't mean that you're going to get paid enough you know yep. what i'm saying so um it's all subjective also but no i agree Every, it doesn't matter who i'm around i always try to learn something from yeah. everybody same everybody. i love it yeah something i look at also is like there's people with less followers that yeah. are great at i don't want to say i don't say getting money at people i think the better way to say it is like if you watch not me particularly but if you're a youtuber and you watch if you watch a youtuber and you love what they do yeah. and you think they're genuine or they're amusing mm -hmm. like i bought a wilson diesel t-shirt because <laughs> he's the fucking best right, right i don't know him yeah i never spoke to him if i went up to him i wouldn't go up to him in person because like it's awkward on the other end right but like i like what he does so i bought it same thing like if you're a youtuber if someone likes you right they like your podcast they will buy something to support you oh no, I, I i mean i haven't sold anything yet well actually you guys should cop the merch Merch coming soon, by the way, as you guys can see. But yeah, I, I agree. People I agree. will support you. People, Shameless if it's good merch, I know I have like nothing on the worst, but no, it's good. <laughs> if people, if people like you, they will support you. And that's something that I've sort of learned. Like there are certain people that capitalize on it really, really amazing. And they're not doing it to be shitty. 
Right. Like if if people didn't want it, they wouldn't sell it. Like right. they come out with a design and then they sell X amount of pieces. It's because people want it. You're right. not forcing anyone to buy it. So it's like, I don't want to say, I don't do the good, I only do the good shameless plug like while I'm doing a giveaway and mm-hmm. I'm like, yo, new merch coming out, X, Y, and Z, right. buy some shit. Other than that, I do have people working on things, designs. I don't push it that hard on people. Right. But there is people that would buy it if it was more easily accessible, I think. Same thing 100%. for you. Like people it's not. want, no, no, but if it gets there, right? Yeah. People it's not, yeah. want that in my opinion people want to support it people like wearing people wear car stuff all the time yeah one of my employees right now different brand car shirt all the time he just watches people on youtube likes it i'll buy a 30 dollar, 40 dollar yeah. t-shirt no problem click right so i think that's something i try to learn that's one of the main things in the past six months i've asked big youtubers um in terms of not help with but like um brand deals and stuff like that that's tough, man. I, I'm going through the same thing you're going yeah. through, bro. I don't ask. I've, yeah. I've never, um, I've never, I don't really have any deals. I've gotten random companies that give me deals on things. Yeah. Like, hey, which is amazing. It's better than the average person. Mm-hmm. But like, um, I spend a lot of money. It's not good. But like people looked at, <laughs> people looked at my, people looked at. <laughs> people, it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> God bless my accountant. He's like, yo, Jordan. <laughs> I have your bank account login. Yo. What are you doing? I was like, Yo, the bills got paid this month, right? But <laughs> my employees just see us not be happy. They like, what the fuck? Um, like my F80 M3. Yeah. I went through 20 grand in clutches. Dual Damn. clutches. Like I paid. Just clutches. Dotson at the end hooked me up because they liked what I was doing and mm-hmm. they gave me a crazy deal. I still paid them some amount of money. Yeah. But like their shit... I, whatever issue I had, they cover. If it was an issue of the product, they covered it. Best brand I've ever, like top brands I've worked with, right? Right. But at the end of the day, DCT is shit. <laughs> it's compared for drag racing. It's yeah. just not it. Right. But like, I've learned um, in terms of brand deal wise, um, I don't know what you'll do. Maybe your end's different. What I've just learned sort of is I only want to work with people that I believe in, that believe in me. Mm. Like if I want to buy something from you and you're not a big company or whatever, but I believe in you, yeah, I'm buying it. So it's like that's something I've learned. But I've tried to talk to YouTubers and content creators about like how do you get this deal? Because like if it's worth it for me to do that F A D M three, yeah, would it be worth it for your not you, but would it be worth it for your brand to be on that car or be involved to some extent? Like what is this worth it for you? And I've had two conversations on that car with two different major companies. Okay. Like content, like you asked about content creation wise. I think this is yeah. the same avenue. No, hundred percent. Yeah, and um, one was uh, super disrespectful, I would say, and rude the entire time. And like, not like we don't need you. I, I came to him. I said, I have enough money. I make enough money to do this. Mm-hmm. Do you want to be a part of it though? You guys suck at marketing. You post nothing, but you have a good product. Right. Right. Is it the best? It's arguable. Like, what's the best? Right. Once again. I talked to another company and they were like, we love what you're like right off the rip. Yeah. They're like, we love what you're doing. We wish we were part of your F80. We want to be a part of this car. Okay. So like right off the rip, what are you choosing? Um, if it the, depends, you're going to choose the money. Like if, if, if it depends, okay, sti- for, it depends on the stipulations of what they're, what they need me to do. Understood for me, like just me morally, if I got $0 from the people that like me, mm-hmm. Versus at the end, once these other people soar, oh, my car is doing really good on social media. It's getting a lot of views. It's going to do great for attention. Right. And they're going to realize, damn, the F80 did numbers. This is going to put up numbers. Their money is no longer good for me. Right. Like the first brand. Brand two, they could give me $0 right now, and I'm with it. The end result will be the same. Right. In my opinion. I can make anything work. Um, And I have not came to... uh, Dollar amount. I haven't even. I I talked to them and they were with it. They're like, we we love what you're doing. We would love to support you in some way. They didn't say any dollar amounts or anything. But like, mm-hmm. I think for you, you'll get you'll get there. Like people. Oh, I mean, we'll we'll see. Yeah, people like like to see car talk. Right. That's why you're here. I'm a car guy. You're a car guy. At yeah. The end of the day. No, 100. percent. I, I I agree with what you're saying. I just um, I think I'm just more focused on. I, I feel like you have to cut, learn how to grow your own your own brand before mm-hmm. you can. I guess work with other brands in that sense, mm-hmm. because if they want you to do certain things, then you have to 
like let's say if i said i'm gonna give away a car right now mm -hmm. uh, the chances of that happening are probably like slim because i don't really have the platform to push that now if i said hey i'll give you uh a, if you guys buy my merch mm -hmm. you guys you know what i'm saying like how you do your giveaways pretty much how everyone's doing it then it makes more sense because then you're known for you know um like giving incentives for a car or something like that yeah so and that's a whole different like it's a whole different avenue. it's a whole different business it's like but so hard it is difficult from what i hear but then again it's like a lot of people think that just because they have a hundred thousand followers that they can just go do giveaways or yeah. they can do all these things and it's not really easy i've had this conversation before um on 45's episode because he's really good at doing giveaways um but he's just become known for that now yes you know so it's 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 he's one of those things so long right Right. So for somebody just to, to get on the platform and say, hey, I have 150,000 followers or 200,000 followers, I'm giving away a, a car. It's like, OK, but there's no it's like there's no credibility there. You know, yeah. it's like, well, how do I know I'm going to get my car? Mm -hmm. Are you a shop? Where's this car yeah. coming from? I still get it. Yeah. I've been tuning people's cars for money <laughs> as a business for like 10 years. Did a giveaway and there's still people like there's this always is not people, real, yeah. which which is fine. But right. at the end of the day, it's a it's another thing. Like it's another learning experience. Mm -hmm. It's another potential business venture. Right. And something I try. And like people think like I've had comments like you're making 120 grand, 100, 200 grand on the car. Yeah. Doesn't work like that. I made money out of three giveaways. I made money like past <laughs> on one so far. And everyone like there might be people that don't believe that. Yeah. And like it is what it is. It is a to do it the right way and legally it is very hard to do it like that and really really do great right but same thing it's sort of hard but it's like one of those things that i make enough money in like rk tunes like tuning cars and selling parts like my branded intakes which is like what works for me yeah that like i'm willing to take that venture and learn it a little bit right i'm not like like gonna go bankrupt off giveaways you know like right. i bought a g80 i want to do development on it i did i built intakes off it i gave away the car if i took a little l it's as horrible as it sounds. It's I was gonna go get an all-wheel drive anyone when anyway. Right. I took a more, like a probably a little bit more of an L mm -hmm. on the giveaway than just trading it in. Then it's like you you win some, you lose some, and you learn over right. time. Right. No, but yeah, I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. But yeah, brand deals, content creation, all that stuff is um something I'm learning still. Yeah, it's a new space. I feel like there's gonna be a lot more um podcasts that come out of course because we're in that we're in that kind of uh phase of content creation but i think that um i think it's going to be harder for people to brand themselves just because even in, with this style of content i'm interviewing people so i have to still be a personality somehow mm -hmm. because the only views that come in most of the time are for for the guest of course right so for me i already have my own brand but i kind of neglected that because i've been so focused on this one so now when it comes time for me to actually sell something or do something, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing because I haven't been on the other platform for myself. Understood. Know? So it's tough. It's like a balance. Like you said, you have to have some type of balance in order for you to be able to make this a long-term thing when it comes to having money coming in or working mm -hmm. with brands. And I think that people um, haven't got there yet when it comes to this podcasting mm -hmm. stuff, they don't know, you know, you may have a podcast, but you have to be somebody at that point to get the views to the podcast. So it's difficult. I started from zero with this. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to see how it goes. And hopefully we can. Oh, it's going running. somewhere. What? It's going somewhere. It seems like. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there. It's getting there. I, I try to focus on, on, you know, that kind of Analytics. stuff. I just try to make sure that uh, the people who are watching are satisfied, which I can't satisfy anybody and please everybody. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm being as selfless as possible. You know, so I'm just putting all my time and effort into this and hopefully it pays off in the end. And if it doesn't, then um, I can say <laughs> I, I try, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of it, like in terms of like, having the satisfaction of like people being happy or not. Yeah. A lot of it is there might be 100 people. There's going to be more 100 people watching this. But if you, like people are going to watch it, I might watch a video and be like, damn, that was good. Or I enjoy that and just right. click off. <laughs> Everyone should go comment and like if you like me right now and be like, damn, I'm happy Jordan's on podcast. But like shit like that makes a difference at the end of the day when people just talk shit down yeah. below it's nice to get positive things <laughs> so hopefully some people do some things is there but like, any <laughs> i don't know i don't know a nicer way to say that no but like yeah. you know what i'm saying like otherwise it's like you get these people just talking shit in the comments right but that's just the nature of what you are but if 100 people or if 10,000 or 30,000 people watch it and that stay watching your duration time like yeah then you know people are enjoying it right i mean you're here you're growing so people like it i've seen it i've seen the little good cut clips and i'm here <laughs> you know i'm locked in 
no i i appreciate it um i'm i'm i think it was um it was i had to it only makes sense to be here and kind of interview um you were on the list i had i had a list actually i haven't even looked at that list in a while mm-hmm. And a lot of the people that are on the top of that list, I've already interviewed. Mm-hmm. So there's bigger people, like there's other content creators, um, which we could talk about offline that, you yeah. know, that I've, I've always watched. And that's the cool thing about this is I, I get to interview people that, you know, I've heard of that. I've never had a reason to go to their shop because I didn't have that car, but I know they do great work. So, and you were one of them. I mean, we've been in contact throughout the years. You don't even remember who I am, which is cool, I'm but I sorry. wasn't expecting, I wasn't expecting <laughs> I mean, that. No, it, it's cool. It's cool. I feel very bad, but it like wasn't enough. I meet so it many people. Enough. Yeah. No, it's, it's cool. Hard. It's cool. I, I, I w- it wasn't enough. Like I didn't have my car here mm-hmm. for you to work on. Mm-hmm. So you to be like, oh, that's Tooks, you know? Mm-hmm. The balance of making people happy is hard. Right. The same thing like you. You might get a bad comment, but a hundred people happy. I might sell a hundred tunes and then in X time frame, And then some guys talking shit online. Like I killed, like I did the worst thing in the world to him, you know, but it's like people often don't always see all the full spectrum of it. Yeah. Like you see the bad guys talking online, right? You don't see the customers that are happy. And if you're not happy, I'm a nice guy. You can get refunded. Right. Straight up. No, hundred percent. It's easy. Yeah. I, I agree. I think that that's one of the things that, um, a lot of people have issues with now, I think with a lot of shops and maybe not even, only new york but for the most part growing up going to shops there's always been oh this shop does that this shop does that and 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 most spoke about that on the last uh episode but it's the truth like the gossip the shop talk it's it's become uh like a common thing in most shops so i think that as a shop owner um the best thing you can do like most said is to you know make sure your customers are happy and that's the same thing i'm trying to do here is to make sure everybody's happy but is that something that you feel um, you worry about or you come across when it comes to building or having a shop on Long Island? Is people putting you down? Yes so or no. Well? So I'll give you, I think, the best uh, shop comparison. I sell tunes to people all over the world. Okay. Okay. Uh, mostly in America, but there's people like right now I did a Z3 in Mexico, as random as it is. I do guys in China, everywhere. But in America, it seems like a lot of what you get is there's different ends of shops. Some shops just do intake, exhaust, tune, right? They're just putting a different tune in the car. Right. And that's fine. And then there's shops like Mo trying to build race cars, right? Like he's, his car makes 12 or 1300 horsepower. He's not trying to build everyone a race car. Right. But then there's other shops. There's like, um, there's lower level and there's higher level than him. Like you have UGR performance mm-hmm. who you could look at as in theory, the standard of hurricanes and right. shit. At the end of the day, you need to be as a customer as like, um, you can't just trust your shop to be the best. If your shop does Chevys all day and they do 800 horsepower Chevys all day and all customers are really happy, go there with your Chevy. Right. Like don't go to a, uh, your, that part of the problem is like shops, their goal is to make money. A shop's a business to make money. Right. And a lot of times what happens is shops worry more about making money than making customers happy they're like they want to make you happy Mm -hmm. but they also make money so it's a very hard balance right me at the end of the day i've stopped working on customers cars so i'm a shop on long island and the shop effectively is a warehouse okay and i have a mechanic for myself Mm. to work on my own cars it is not to work on a single customer car anymore anymore right but i did do it and the problem that i had was dealing with shops like other shops will lie to you and tell you, we'll cut, we'll do a better deal. We'll do this. We'll do that. Or they'll tell you, don't go to Jordan. We get tuned by a different guy. He's better. And we can go back to what's better. Right. Cause if I have the fast F80 and they want to tell you that this guy's F 80s tune is better. Yeah. It's probably not better, but they want your money. Me. You want to go elsewhere. I never cared. Right. It doesn't matter. It's like my primary Income is tuning cars online, remote tunes, and mm-hmm. then now selling my RK Tunes branded intakes um, that we designed based on years plus of dyno testing cars, seeing what worked. Right. I figured out what works, made a intake that doesn't have MTAX and stuff. But all these other shops want your money. So I've had so many shops that like I deal with, I'm cool with the owners, and I hear the things that come through like, don't go to him, come to us. Why if you're a customer okay. and you're local? Why are you going to go to whatever other shop and have them do the work just to come get me to tune your car anyway? 
they're gonna the shop is gonna be like don't have him tune the car because the problem is if they tell you to come to me to get the car tuned you're gonna say why am i coming to you at all i'm just gonna go, yeah, to, jordan go to jordan to get yeah. everything done that was a big issue of drama that i had with tuning cars mm. and that was like my biggest problem but yeah. i have enough I have enough business because of how I present myself online, how I sell tunes online that like, I don't fight for the in-person stuff and most in-person stuff, everyone's fighting to the bottom. A lot right. of time, these shops want to out underbid each other underperform. Right. And then all of a sudden your bills double, your bills got shit added on. They miscalculated things. It's a very hard balance being a shop owner. Like I give credit to like the top tier people yeah. out there that do it and do it properly. Like owning a shop and running it. Shops, like it, it's a it's a hard business. I tried being like shop foreman technically, running a yeah. shop here. I had three full time mechanics and a helper, Damn. like working on people's cars. But um, it's a very hard balance. It's very easy to lose hours. Like if I told you I had two hundred plus hours into my yellow car, you might be like, "Damn, two hundred <laughs> times one hundred fifty, right, is a wild yeah amount of money, right?" Like people would be like, "I would never spend that. That's fine." But maybe like if you got a quote from a shop that didn't do that normally, they might tell you, oh, it's like 10 grand labor, I think, right? Yeah. Your car lives there now. Your car's a lawn ornament at that shop, mm. right? So it's like, or the other end, they miscalculated and now it's not 10 grand, it's 60,000 at the end of the day. So like because you figuring labor, out yeah. the shop for what you want is really, really important. Right. And in terms of getting scammed at shops, it's going to happen. Like not by me. I'd rather be honest and take like an L or something. Yeah. But it got to the point where like me competing with other shops wasn't towards my goal. I'd rather have, for me, I'd rather have 20 happy tune customers that I emailed back that day with a revision or whatever the case may be. First, one guy, yo, it's my old chain son, my old chain son, my old chain son. <laughs> it ain't worth it, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Like I had so many, I've had so many wonderful customers that I really, really like to this day. If I see them, I really, really like them. But the, the being a shop owner and what the customer wants or deserves, the problem is customers sometimes you think are like rude or th they think that they deserve more. Yeah. And it's not, I don't really think it's a customer being the problem. It's they've had shit experiences or heard of shit experiences with all these shops. I agree. I, I agree with that. I'm, I, I've been through the same thing. So mm -hmm. I'm just speaking from a customer standpoint mm -hmm. that when you have that, like um, bad experience, you automatically think like every shop's a scam. Or for example, car dealerships. I oh, already know. I also do not like dealing with car dealerships. Do you, I already know. I don't like it. I, I hate it, but every time, like, you know, if my girl was to buy a car and we were, she was going to the dealership, I'm there. Yep, same. 100%. And like, even then, they're trying to, I went to the dealership the other day. Yeah. The lady was so nice. But she's trying to hype me up on some car. And I was like, you know what I drove here <laughs> you, today? They have no you know clue. They think they're like, like they finessing you. Yeah, they're like, oh, this is a, it was like saying like you have an X4 M40i and it's an X4M. It's not, a, it was not what it was, but it's not an X4M, lady. <laughs> I know. I've had multiple, I have five M3s right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't, don't talk to me. It's funny if you like, don't, if they don't even know that, she you can kind of mess around with The them. other people, someone else there like knew me. I went through a friend, but the guy wasn't, wasn't available or whatever. Yeah. But I want, I, I don't, I'm too nice. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm a dick online sometimes. Like I'm a dick in person, but I'm not gonna tell say, yo, you don't know what I have, blah blah, and like whatever. So car dealers, bro, bad. And it's not because they're all scammers, but their business is to make money. Same with same same, same thing with shops, shops. yeah. And yeah. some people want you to have the best experience possible, like Alpha Induction Performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much that shit costs to go there. <laughs> if they charge double the next guy. I guarantee they could charge the same as the next guy. Yeah. But like I'm going there for my car because I know the service I'm getting is going to be what they told me. They, if, and then we'll turn this into one other thing, but if you're a, so here's, here's my, the other end of this. I am a tuner, right? If I put my backpack on and tune a car at a different shop, right? One car here, one car there, six months, year, two years later. I've seen a lot of different shops. I've gone across the country. I've tuned a lot of cars. What you learn is one shop, right? When something fails, they're going to call you. Oh, yeah. You remember that car we did X amount of time ago? Mm -hmm. yeah, the fucking wastegate line burst, right? And you're like, wastegate line burst? That's crazy. Which one was it? And they're like, I use this. And we get, we get I don't want to say who it is. My friend used it like a push lock hose. And I told him, don't do that shit. 
It's not going to last long term, whatever. Right. For right now, dyno hit is okay. Right. That tuner now is like, oh, damn, maybe that's not a great idea. Right. And then another customer hits him up. Remember that car you tuned? Shit blew up. Why? To this wastegate line burst. Or do the, the gas tank and the, the fuel hose in the tank leaked. Yeah. Or you're the tuner diagnosing the car. Why is that bad fuel pressure? You're like, damn, this hose burst in the tank. Second car, hose burst. All of a sudden, a shop could build 10 cars the same way and on the seventh car have a problem and change their way. If you're one tuner and you tune all these cars for this shop, cars for the next shop, cars for the next shop, you're, what I'm saying at the end is, is trust your tuner because your tuner is the guy that's seen the most. Your shop is probably wrong. If a tuner is good and your tuner says, yo, you need to do a boost leak test, you probably have a boost leak, your sh- make sure your shop boost leak tests it. Yeah. I have shops like, yo, it's good. And I reply back, did you do a boost leak test? Send. You know, like, <laughs> but you have to trust your tuner, not your shop. Right. And if you should almost find your tuner first and then find the shop that they send you to, is my opinion, if they have one. And if not, they just have to have a shop that can communicate. But like dealing with the shops and shit, especially like honestly, just New York, everywhere. There's so many shops that under that under offer things or underperform. Yeah. But the tuners the other end, I'm not saying like every tuner's great, every tuner's wonderful. Right. But like even me, I've seen so much. So I have cars come here and I'm like, yo, you shouldn't do this like this. And they're like, why? And in my head, I'm like, I don't know what car it was that broke. Yeah. But this shit's like me, every fuel pump I do has a certain brand hose in the tank. I do not play games. Okay. I do not care. It looks like OEM. It's like a PTFE hose, and I won't use any brand, and I won't use the dark ones. Like there's like a black or brown color ones. Mm-hmm. I've seen them burst. I only use the clear ones, and it, it's a brand thing. Okay. So one brand's black one could be better than the other. I've just seen too many of the black ones from right. different fuel pump manufacturers burst. So like I use one thing, and that's something I learned. So when a car comes here and your shop did it, and you're a builder, maybe you didn't do that. Right. So it's like, if you ask me the suggestions and I tell you, your tuner tells you, your tuner's probably seen more. Like I've done, my tune is on hundreds, if not a thousand Turbo E36s in America. Like just statistically of how many maps I've ordered over the past X amount of time. Yeah. Um, if it's like, it's like a wild amount when you add it up. And I've done, I've sent out, it's not custom dyno tunes or whatever, but thousands of tunes okay. for different BMWs. So like, I've seen some shit. Yeah. If you're one shop that only does E46s, then you do E36. You might not see the problem. So if there is a problem, you talk to your tuner and he's like, hey, check this. There's probably a reason if he's good. If he's new and he's in like the learning stages, maybe not so much. So basically listen to your tuners. Yeah. And the tuner's really job is not even, the tuner's real job is not to tune cars. A tuner's real job is to diagnose your issues. And a tuner is my, there's gonna be tuners. Maybe like, don't say that's my job. Cause it's not my job. That's my job. When I put a car on the dyno, I'm not sitting there like, okay, I got to add fuel and do this and do that. No, my job is like, okay, did they do a good job on the fuel pump? Fuel pressure seems good. Do mm-hmm. a pull. Fuel pressure still seems good. Okay, cool. Is the, like, check the deal right. My job is to diagnose your car and make sure it's good to the best of my ability. There's times I know many tuners that I even had a car once. It kept going lean and it ended up damaging a piston. But I didn't blindly hit it. I was like doing a pull. And as the air fuel trended, started trending lean, we'd back it down. Right. And we changed fuel pump regulator. I think one of the fuel lines in the car was crushed. Like like damaged somewhere. Yeah. It's a 20, 30-year-old car now. And it was going lean up top. Fuel pressure was crashing. Right. That one didn't get saved in time. Mm. Heard a piston. On an E36. Talking right. about years, like right. shitty things. The guy wasn't mad. I told the guy, your car is doing this. But like with the exceptional that, you know, but a situation I told him, this can happen if I keep testing this and trying this. Your tuner is really diagnosing your good and bad of the car at the end of the day. And the tune is only as good as the mechanics of the car. That's true. I mean, yeah, that's true. Like a fuel pump hose rips. Yeah. I don't that's, care what ECU you have. I don't care how fast it is. It can only typically do so much. Right. Fuel trim so much. Add enough injector. Like there's only so much a lot of these things can do. So like mechanical is the best. Mechanical is the most important part of the car. And the tuner jobs diagnose. So there's no issues with tuners when it comes to like them, you know, not getting in contact with you or. Oh, that is a thing. Like, okay. like it's if 
if I'm away and I have poor time management, I try mm-hmm. to be really good. Like, yeah. I do try to be good. And there will be people down below now that I say this talking shit. I bought a tune and he took so long, whatever. Um, in the past many years of my life, I've learned a very good way of handling it. I have a ticket system that is all in order. Okay. Your email does not get missed. It has to be closed out. You can't read an email. It doesn't disappear. It's so like for me, I've learned that's what I need to handle every customer's order. Right. I have a ticket system. I go in order. Could I be behind sometimes? Yes. Could I hit you in an hour sometimes? Absolutely. But like I have a wait time on my website depending on how busy we are. Mm-hmm. I have a wait time on my automated reply email telling you how long to wait. Right. It says, please do not reply for no reason because you're going to slow yourself down. Like it's all there. Yeah. But like if someone's unhappy with me and I took too long, I will give you a refund. If someone's going to say, well, 10 years ago you didn't do that. My bad, bro. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. I'm still learning. Yeah. But that's, yeah. So that happens. Some tuners suck. I think if you're waiting like forever for a tune and you're not happy and you ask for a refund and they won't give it, I think it's a problem. If you're on like revision 15 and you're just like, you know, like there's a level of like revisions right. on and etiquette and stuff like right. that. But I think if it's like first file a revision or two in and the guy's taking forever and you're unhappy, I think you should get, you should be entitled to a refund. Right. But it goes both ways. There's people that will hit me up seven years later. Hey man, you to my car seven years ago. <laughs> Literally. I mean, very serious. I made my first website when I was 21 years old. So 12 years ago. Yeah. I have people that bought out like 10 year old tunes, like need revisions. And now I charge for that up until two years ago. I would do it. No charge. Damn. adjust it for them whatever but like yeah. there's an etiquette on both ends right i have things change software changes tunings changes like the features now like f80s that that these companies like boom or whatever mm-hmm. add into these ecus they weren't there a few years ago so if you want a new tune and you want your car redone i gotta make you a new tune it's not i did your tune and a month later you need something tweaked it's five years later you change your turbo you got to buy a new tune because a platform I use could be changed. Right. The software changed, the logic changed and like your old tunes garbage now. Right. You've uh, adjusted your, your business to cater technically towards the customer because of the people that were complaining that you were taking a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it has happened. And there is people that have complained. I mean, nobody's perfect. Of course people always, you know, I, I I get it, but it's a very common thing with tuners, but yeah, I, I think that most tuners, they have this, um, this uh preconceived notion i don't know if if that's they have this 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 thing where it's like everybody already already knows that they are going to take a while to answer or tuners are bougie oh yeah yeah and that that could be a thing that's definitely that's definitely a thing yeah but like i think i'm like easy to talk to i give really shitty replies in terms of length like you could send me three paragraphs and i'm gonna tell you exactly what you need back Uh i'm not gonna like sit there for 20 minutes and write you a beautiful email but like if you ask me five questions i will copy paste it write replies like i'm good like that but like in terms of being bougie i mean people probably will say that um it is it is what it is it's the nature (laughs) of it's the nature of whatever you know like my job is and also like tuners some people will say tuners are annoying he's making me do this making me do that not every tuner is the best also i know saying trust your tuner yeah make sure you find a good one with a good track record right like ask people they have problems like, i'm not gonna call them out but there's guys at f80s that people say he's the best he has this stock fuel system ed5 whatever record and then like you find out how many cars blow up that they do mm. you know and it's like where's the thing about that and people online will call me f uh, rk boom and this and that and i'm like find me five cars that broke you know like that, like made too much power, window the block. I don't put myself in those situations. Right. That's why I like my car, built motor, fuel system. I'm going to push it. But if everyone says that that motor blows up at 700 wheel torque, like F80, yeah. I'm going to give you 650. That's it. You're not going to get 700. Just to, just to prove that you make the highest horsepower. I get well, it. Well, no, I'm yeah. saying I'm going to do less because I don't want your car to break. I care more no, I'm about saying your other car shops. breaking. I'm saying yeah. other shops will do that. They'll, they'll probably push the, the platform further in that tune just to make sure that other they have tuners the right because they want not that you stock, i'm saying because they don't people, care yeah. about you right i do like you want to i'll tell someone you know if you have pistons rods do a fuel you can make whatever yeah and i have guys that like run 50 pounds of boost on fad like turn up yeah you know like beef for the a2 they turn up and it's not a problem right because it works it's it's reliable i don't want to break man. your shit you want to <laughs> go find i have a customer recently uh won't say who x 3 m he knows who he is yeah such a nice guy such a nice guy. I told him, I don't want to turn your car up anymore. I don't want to break it. 
right? We did all the shit to it. Um, it definitely could have been turned up more than where I had it potentially, right? right? He could have done street locks, which he did. I could have maybe made it a little bit faster. Yeah. I did not want to break the stock motor. Okay. He went elsewhere. Who went to the block? Like he went elsewhere, got tuned and like it got faster and he windowed the block. You know how I don't feel good that his car broke. He's such a nice guy. I just feel good. I did not break his car. Right. Like there's another local shop too. Want me to tune his car. Had someone else tune it first. Had a bunch of problems. I was like, I don't want to get involved. Yeah. That guy's car broke and blew up. Like, I'm not saying it happens all the time. Yeah. But like, I don't want to be the guy breaking people's cars either. Like, I don't want to be that That's tuner. fair. That's and fair. And people could talk shit and say I blow cars all the time. Y'all can't find five straight up. Y'all probably can't find two. You can say I break my own car, but I'm doing what is, I'm doing what everyone else isn't. Same thing on my G80. Like, I'm going to make it a little bit lighter. Yeah. And I'm posting everything on my G80. Nothing's hidden at right. all. Every pound I take out is posted. Everything. I'm just going to do a little bit more. Right. But it's when it's uh, able, like when it's when it's, when you can. You don't want to do that on someone's stock motor. Like imagine some guy tells you your car is good for eight hundred, right? And then you brakes. How do you feel? That's why you got to do your research. Yes, and then maybe ask <laughs> yeah. for like a little bit less. Yeah, ask for a little bit softer. I know it sounds horrible, but right. like, unless you're willing to burn your shit down, and maybe you are. Yeah, no, you have to. You I'm have not. To do research. Yeah, I took my stock motor out. <laughs> I don't want to break it. It's right. worth too much money. Like I'm spending all this money on the car. Imagine burning down a $10,000 motor. It's nah. not for me. So like tuner wise, that's really important too. track record. And then also find somebody you trust mm -hmm. and then trusting them. Pretty solid information. You have this video on your, your page. You were drifting and you, you, you oh. realized there was a, a, a behind you. Oh, that shit's real. So you, did you ever post a part two of that? Like the, the part two is my camera went down. Cop, I didn't have a rear camera like showing backwards. It was like undercover, right? Pulls up on my shit, right? Like on my shit. Yeah. I get off the fucking exit. I'm like, shoo, shoo, shoo. and I'm like, fuck. Get off the exit. Dude's on my bumper. Gets off with me. I go to get on the next exit to do like a loop de loop, right? On my bumper. Last second pulls away. I was like, the, the sigh of relief was crazy. Did he see you actually hitting the you turn? Had, he he had to have. I drifted the whole thing onto the parkway practically. And then the next part was that same day driving to work. I never posted this clip. I had the head cam on yeah. again. I drift the exit right here. And I pull up to the red light and shut it down. You know, like drift up to the red light and then stop or right. the yield sign or whatever. As I'm stopping, I stop. Another passes me and i was like this is two times i'm lucky in a day i'm fucking done i was like i'm gonna record a whole youtube video of like random street drifting right and i quickly learned it ain't worth it with that yeah yeah, yeah. no definitely that's definitely uh, I, I i saw that video a while ago and i remember i was like damn i wonder what happened after People thought it was fake. That? i mean yeah. the fake ones would probably do just as good i could be more energetic in a fake one yeah but i mean that shit was as real as it gets <laughs> i am like i have other clips i can probably send you right People see me doing that turn all the time. It is like near where I get off every day. Yeah. And people see me doing, I get clips. I got two other people, random dude behind me recording. I'm like, that's my turn. Yeah. I love that turn. So you, you mentioned, you mentioned recently, I love that turn. You mentioned recently that you, uh, you feel like the, the F80 is the best drift car for you. Why, why do you say that? So it's a good, okay. F80 compared to older cars compared to newer cars. Yeah. F80 makes 500 horsepower stock or four, 440, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. 500 wheel pump gas tune. It is heavy. 36, 3,800 pounds. Right. E36, 3,200 pounds. But you make 500 wheel on that and drift it at the track. You can break axles, diff, um, hub thingy. Right. Transmissions. F80. Um, I broke, I have upgrade axle. I had spares, my fast car, like Mo talked about having spares, everything. I had spares, everything. Like I had spare axles yeah. for the car. I have blocks. I have everything. I had spare transmissions on deck. Right. I never use a spare axle. I put axles in it. I don't think it needs it. I'm on stock drive shift. I'm on stock transmission on that car. Someone drove the car and broke the transmission due to them. Like clutch dumps in third gear mm -hmm. type thing. But Overall, I think that's a solid all-around car. It has AC. Like, it does drift. It has a crazy angle kit, so the wheels get super-duper sideways. And it's not going to win competitions. Okay. But overall, 
I put 12,000 miles, I think, on that car in two years of ownership. Okay. And that's including, like, we drive from track to track. So I do a thing called Drift Week. The first one's in the um, Northwest. I right. think like 5,000 street miles between drift tracks. So like you drive crazy. on the track, they transport your wheels and tires for you. Okay. But you need to bring your tool, you need to bring the spares, no trailers allowed. So all my miles are from Drift Weeks on that car. Damn. So like I drove California, Arizona twice. Uh, one round trip and one half because one started in Arizona. So I mean like, how about driving your car on the track, beating the piss out of it, hopping in, Apple CarPlay, AC on, eight hour drive, 100 miles per hour, nothing. Mm. Like like easy mode. So like I also did a drift week in my yellow M240. No AC, no heat, no radio, no sound ending. I have like three mufflers though because I don't want it really loud. Yeah. Like everything else is freaking loud. And I did uh, I did two drift weeks in that one, I want to say. Yeah. One or maybe one drift week in that, one and a half. And it is not the same experience. The yellow car is 3,100 pounds. Damn. So it is way lighter. It makes more power. It's more nimble. It's a better drift car, but not a better all-around drift car. And G80 for drifting is a little too big and heavy, right. I think. That 4,000 or 3,900 pound car or whatever it is, it's got to be 200 pounds more than an F80, like manual versus manual. Right. It does make more power, but that just means like it doesn't have that much more grip. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to smoke more tires and like you're going to get gapped by an NAE 36, 328, straight up. Like on a tight track. Yeah. On a big long track, F80 is winning. But on a tight track, like there's tracks in uh, um, Pat's Acres or something, Cali, whatever it was. Yo, dude, I'm getting gapped. Because the time it takes to slow the car down and then transition, yeah. if you're a really good driver, you'll probably be fine. I'm getting gapped by E36s. So. But that car is gone. Oh, it's behind me. But I did giveaway on it. Right. So um, this car is actually begin it's, it's already the, it's, done. The sweepstakes company drew the winner, verified him. I posted it today. He is locked in. It is his car. Some kid from Oregon. That's crazy, I man. Saying, everyone said I pronounced Oregon wrong. What is it Oregon? Or, Oregon. Or that he's from there. Um, How, so what did, Danny, what did he? What did he purchase? Yo, he bought. So it's super crazy. I won't say everyone's name, but when they do the drawing, they draw multiple people in right. case like you don't reply to them. You think it's a spam, or your license or something. Yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Or like you won't give your tax info because right. it's like a very legal process. The way that I do it, he bought a single E36 T-shirt of my last giveaway car. Like that. One T-shirt, I think it was forty dollars, and just won that car. And I think ten grand. I have to fucking go to the bank and take out and give him. And the second place, like that, didn't win the car because the yeah. first place was a winner. Bought a JZX one hundred shirt that I have. Third place spent some more money. Bought bought multiple things. Mm. But like, it's not I say third place. There's one place winner, but it just means like if that guy didn't win, right? You know, it would be available to the next place person. And I don't tell the rest of people like their names because they would suck if you're like, damn, I almost won. Yeah, but but yeah, so that's who who locked it in, and that's it's it's gonna be his car. I'm so, trying to schedule for him to come out and get it. But I fucked up though because I love that car, dude. I should give him anything else. Straight up, it's crazy. Yeah, it's nice. The F80 is a really dude. nice car. I really love the way that's like probably one of the best looking uh, BMWs to me. Yeah. Uh, me personally, I think. And uh, it's like raw still. Yeah, like a Supra might feel raw because like so small and good. Yeah, but like a G80 is a big car. It right. feels bigger. Right. So like for me, I think like after that, I'm not, I want to do it right away, but it ain't happening. I want to do an M2 drift car, a mm. brand new M2 red. That'd be fire. But like something like that. Yeah. Angle kit, inline handbrake, all the rear arm bushings. So the suspension solid and that, but, um, dollar wise, I was hoping we'd do a giveaway, get some monies up and go buy one. <laughs> ain't there yet. <laughs> you ever think the giveaways makes hundreds of thousands of dollars? They, yeah. I like it. I do it. It's going to, it's going to work over time. I think. Um, but it's like one of those things that's probably my next, um, I mean, this yellow E36 is going to be a drift car next, but that's something I had a car for six years. It just yeah. sits here to put an angle kit and a handbrake in that car is light work. Right. That's, that's like two day process at worst to buy a new M2. That's mm. a big one. Probably once the G80 is rocking and rolling. Yeah. Then maybe I'll get a new M2. Cause like, I just thought it was cool that I had like the fast F80. Right. And then I also had an F80 drift car at the same time, like two separate cars. So I just thought that was super cool. So I think doing the same thing with the G80 platform, the yeah. S58 platform will be super cool also. That's really my mindset. Like when somebody wins the car, do they have to come pick it up or? Wait, most of the times, depends on how you do your giveaway. Okay. Um, 
Well, you are specifically. Yeah, mine, you, it's not in the rules that I'll fly you out and then ship the car to you. Okay. It could be. Right. I bet more people would enter if they knew that was part of it. Right. But I, that's what I do. Like, you win it. Um, the you first gotta, person was local, so they just drove over. Like, I didn't give them gas money or anything. Right. They drove three hours or something. Damn. They didn't complain. They got GEDM3. Right. Like, my first one. I and, wouldn't complain And either. 20 grand, bro. <laughs> like, he wasn't going to be like, yo, I need 50. He brought me a bottle of alcohol or something. Like, he was like, thank you. I'm like, cool, bro. Like, super nice guy. But this one, I'm going to fly him out. I think he wants to come him and someone else, he said. Okay. And then I'll fly him out. He'll see the car. I'll get some sort of reaction. And then I'm taking him for a ride in it or something. And then um, if he puts insurance, he could drive it. If he so, doesn't, he's not going to, like, while it's under my insurance. The the thing I've always wondered with giveaway cars, let's say if you win a car, right? Do you have to pay taxes on it? Okay. Uh, depends on how you do it. Okay. Mo- like, 8080, for example, yeah. they're they're doing it a certain way. Adam LZ, a lot of these people offer cash on it because everyone thinks it's to pay taxes on registering the car it's use it how it, the legal term is use it however you please mm-hmm. but it shows as income when you win the car it's not taxes on like mm. if you win that car it goes on your social or whatever that you made whatever the prize value is really yep on that year so if i give this guy the car on january 1st it'll be on his taxes or whatever that he got that much whatever for so but then you still have to pay taxes on that amount yes at the end of the year when yep. you file your taxes that's why right? people give cash can you do it in the business like let's say if you win a car i say if i want to put it in tooks productions name. you should buy an entry i don't know how that works in terms of it you got to buy the entry with a card business account right i don't know if that's i don't know if it has to be a person not a business uh, okay, okay and like if you win you cannot have your mother brother sister take the prize and do it legally under their name like you order it, you're winning. If your mom orders it, she's winning. Right. Your sister orders it, she's winning. I would assume if you put your information in, you know, this is who I am, pay with the yeah, yeah. business. Side. I don't know. I'm sure you could probably do that. Maybe accounting. Not sure. Maybe I'm like you talk about to, that. Maybe you talk to your accountant or something, yeah. whatever. I don't know. All I know is I have a third party sweepstakes company. Okay. That's the same one as a lot of big companies. Right. I pay them. They handle it. I'm not worried. They figure it all out. It's like they do all the tax stuff or right, whatever right. it is. But that's my understanding of it. And someone could say I'm wrong. But that's Yeah, I'm sure somebody will, you know, yeah. know more information about that. Um so yeah, what's what's next for you, man? What are you what are you, what are your plans for the next couple of years? What are you trying to do with this with uh, you know, RK Tunes and what are your goals? Um so this is something I've thought about more in the past year of my life than mm-hmm. ever before. I've always been trying to just get through my day. Day to okay. day. Like you said you came here for I'm running around doing some bullshit yeah. by me slowing down the, the in-person stuff mm-hmm. and extremely limiting what I dino. It's what I really want to do. Whatever okay. part I really want to dino. Um, I want to focus more on expansion of like they said intakes before like multiple times production stuff right. that can get to more people. People offer an intake for a B58 car that's $500 which is literally a pipe like this long or $300 or this long and a filter. They're like, this is sick. I offer a front man intake, puts it in front of the car for the same dollar amount because it's like the M-Tax is crazy. Like right. even some of the BMWs, my stuff is the cheapest intake for that car. And right. in my opinion, it is the best performing. Like if you look at Mike Body, he's like good. I'm not, there's no shade on him. Yeah. Your man's, he got G80. He's going to crush it. Right. I'm trying to be the fastest, but he's, we know he's going to crush right. it. Right. So we'll see how it goes. He has a B58 stock motor car that set the record. It's the same one that made a thousand wheel now, yeah. stock motor. That car, he ran a front mount. He got my front mount intake because he said it worked the best. Mm. From his customers' cars. Right. Air temp data. He was like, a mutual friend was like, hey, the shop CT was like, hey, Mike Body needs an intake. Like, I talked to Mike Body. Yeah. I never spoke to him. Yeah. Just through people. Mike Body needs an intake. Okay, he can just have one. Right. right? So he, I gave him a yellow one. That's all I have in stock. <laughs> so I gave him a yellow intake. He rocked it. Fastest X3M, my intakes. Fastest stock turbo cars or stock frame that have dual intakes mm-hmm. or single intakes run my stuff. So it's the highest performing, like proven and affordable because it's like cancel out some of the M-Tax. Right. So building up that inside the business and trying to do more production stuff that allowed to more growth and expansion of the name. The giveaway thing is like a side mission. 
Okay. It's like I see it like it could do good over time and I'm still learning and it's almost like a project that you work on. Like right. you over time you'll do little side missions probably. Like maybe this is like this is seems like this is it for you, but like you're gonna try little things as everyone learns yeah. and tries to get better. Like everyone wants to progress in life. Right. Absolutely. And I, yeah. That's why but so that um and more products like that potentially. A few other things I'm like trying to work on, but nothing that's like really in motion. Yeah. Um of side ventures. Okay. Car, all car related. All though. car related. Stuff. Yeah. No, like I don't do like not no real estate person. Yeah. Like I'm just locked in with cars. Yeah. I'm just as dumb as the next car guy spending his money on his cars. Cause like that, um, expanding the tuning side potentially a little bit more right. because I've stopped doing it in person. I can do more online tunes. Right. And like I said, I'd rather make 20 people happy than that one person. Even like right. dynamic one person's car takes me all day. One revision takes 15 minutes. Like Damn. me to do a pull, let it warm up for a minute or two, do a pull, record it, check the data log, review it, make a file flash 15 minutes. If you send me an email, all I do is open the data log in an email, check it, revise it and flash it. It's like one minute or two minute. So I can make more people happy yeah. if I'm not physically doing that end. So more tuning, more parts development and more drifting. The drifting is also just fun. So I'm trying to do more fun drifting, not pro not compete really maybe i'll do some fun comps yeah my end goal is not to be a pro drifter okay it's just to go out and have fun with friends that's cool because i think i'm there yeah i yeah. think i can yeah you can. Right. the pro drifters don't make money like there's some right but most of them are just trying to get by because they love drifting right luckily i found something else that can um make support. people happy yeah and make me money and support that at the same time right i'm not just a car guy trying to like make money to go sh do shit i'm just <laughs> dumb like the next guy <laughs> well well said um well said man I, I hope i hope nothing but the best for you Thank i'm you. glad that we were able to sit here and shop it up for this long can you tell the viewers where to find you yeah rk tunes pretty much instagram rk tunes youtube rk tunes i'm doing a full build videos of the g80 okay you see nothing really new like i said if there's delays i still record things but i don't want to just post bullshit right i want to just post good stuff right pretty much on my, on my youtube channel so okay. Instagram, RK Tunes, YouTube, RK Tunes. How do we enter the next giveaway? Hi, uh, RK, so if you go to RK Tunes like on any of those things, rktunes.com is where you buy tunes, intakes, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a direct link to merch and giveaway stuff whenever there's giveaways on. Okay. It's rktunes.us. I okay. know it seems weird that it's two separate things and sites. It's just because that's like a side mission of mine, the giveaway thing to try and learn. Right. So like it keeps it easier as a separate entity. Right. You right, buy right. things from there. I don't want someone buying an $800 intake and getting entered and someone buying a $40 <laughs> t-shirt and feeling like they're asked out. Right. I want it to be like, you want to enter here, you enter here. So that makes sense. .us. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, guys, uh, make sure you guys also cop some merch. I know this is like the first time I'm talking about it on the <laughs> podcast. Um, but hopefully by the time this video comes up, you guys will have a link to purchase some hoodies and some t-shirts as well. So, uh, yeah, please support the brand. As we spoke about earlier, if you support the brand, you will support it by purchasing merch. I don't have any fancy cars to give away yet, <laughs> but hopefully you guys can show some love and uh, rock the brand. So until next time, guys, make sure you guys like, share, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.